She came to me. Please join me in a <laughs> pledge to the flag. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the Selectman's meeting uh, for August 7th, 2017. And I'm going to make a request here before we go to public comment for everybody. We've had a lot of complaints about people not being able to hear what's going on in the meeting because people are not speaking into their microphones or not speaking clearly. So whenever you're giving something and talking, if you could just say it clearly and into the microphone, that would be really nice. Thank you. Uh, okay, now we'll go to uh, public... Oh, well, we have a public hearing pursuant to ASA 31, colon 95-B, to apply for, accept, and expend unanticipated monies in the amount of 267000 Five hundred and forty-three and forty-six cents, or more, from the New Hampshire Department of Transportation. Would like to speak to that, Mr. Uh, Town Manager. I would, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, as we all know, the governor came down last week and presented us with a check for slightly more than a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, the legislature passed an enabling act uh, on SB SB 38 for appropriations to additional highway block grant funds for the sum you had mentioned, which is. $267,543.46. The Act requires us to hold a public hearing in accordance with RSA 3195B for the selectmen to accept after a dual notification. This was advertised more than 10 days before the meeting uh, in the request uh, <coughs> with paper uh, so that we could make this meeting and not have to wait until the end of the month. Okay. And where do we need to go on this? You need to uh, have a vote to approve if you wish to accept the funds. Uh, I'll tell you, we've already deposited them because we don't let checks of this size lay around. Uh, and I believe the Department of Public Works will be prepared this evening to uh, to tell you where the funds would be spent because this is highway block grant funds that need to be spent on highways or bridges. Okay. We have the director and assistant director. And if you'd like to give us the directions on what you'll be doing with this. All right. Um, I did include with Chris, uh, we went through our list of paving streets. Um, and what will sort of piggyback off of this is a paving bid that uh, we've already put out, knowing that we had our original block grants for the Warren article, but then this extra money, and where could we use it? Uh, so the department recommends that this funding be used to complete paving services, including but not limited to Woodland Road, from Little River Road to the town line. And the town road that's actually labeled town road on the map, uh, that is off of Mill Road. It runs up behind the water tower into the cemetery. Uh, that road is a smaller road in, in extreme disrepair. Any additional funding beyond that, uh, we've done some cost estimates of what it would cost, but um, not knowing exactly where it would end up, we would use to improve the next sheet on our uh, DPW list of roads that need to be paved. Okay. And then uh, just to follow up that the paving services would be completed uh, in accordance with the unit pricing that was provided uh, for our paving bid once the board accepts uh, that paving bid as well. Okay. Any other you want to add? The one thing I'd like to add to it is that, you know, we are prepared to utilize this funding because through the CIP process we put out a plan that takes us now through 2023. There's a number of roads. Uh, identified on that that's the same CIP that goes to the uh, planning board uh, so we literally just move would move roads up the street or, or up the list the other thing um, that was pointed out to me today is uh, also to mention that uh, part of the monies for instance uh, two winters ago um, we always have unplanned expenses um, particularly one was uh, Gale Road where literally 700 feet of the road fell apart um, we over restrict ourselves with each little dry every section of road in writing then I have little or no ability to help out in that type of situation but that year we did have uh, money that we were carrying over and we were able to include that section of road in the paid uh, project and this that this money allows us to do the same thing okay uh, before I go to the board I'll go to anybody in the public wishing to speak to this uh, please state your name and your address. You're opening at what 
time, Mr. Chairman. Just public comment. Public comments being opened at 7.05. Thank you. Uh, Mary Louise Woolsey, 148 Little River Road. I have two questions. Little River Road doesn't touch the town line anywhere. Correct. We're going from, we're doing Woodland Road. Oh. Yes. From Little River Road to North. the town line. Okay. I am misunderstood. And the second question is, in the Warren article that you have annually for the roads, is the, I just don't remember the figure. Is this the figure that was contained in that Warren article that this supplements the 600000 or whatever you were looking no, for? No, this is actually unanticipated, unanticipated funds. So this is over and above and yes. what you stipulated in that Warren article. Correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody from the board, Virginia, do you have any questions on this? Well, yeah, that's anticipated funds. So we have the 650 is what mm -hmm. it was. <coughs> so now we have this 267,000. Um, we had had some discussions on some of the people that are having major flooding issues down off of uh, Kings Highway. Mm -hmm. And also we had a meeting last week with folks off of Brown Ave and Ashworth Ave. Is there any way that you could foresee maybe some of that money going to be able to help them out a little bit with some? I know we came up with some short-term solutions for the, the residents down on uh, on off of uh, Kings Highway, right? And I know it's a little bit more difficult for the people down at the uh, South Beach, the main beach, because right. their situation is a little bit different. But I think the concern with me is that the existing circumstances are very similar for both places. I mean, they have the... Well, to answer your question directly, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, certainly, if we don't solve some of the drainage issues down in Green Street, uh, I'll be turning around to repave the street because the pavement falls apart. Um, last week, it was brought to... Well, the gas company went down and either was in... I think they were installing... No, sorry. The water company went down. They were installing a service full-time. Uh, we went down and while they had the pipes open, inspected our drainage lines. They're perforated. They've literally, um, like somebody shot holes through them um, because they're the old steel pipes. Uh, they don't like the brackish water too well. Um, and literally, as much water would flow into them was flowing out of them. Uh, and Toby's got a video and it looks like under pressure was just flowing out. So it's obvious that. You know, this is road work money, and the three most important things in road work are drainage, drainage, and drainage. So until we solve that down there, um, you know, I can't really go in and do m much else. And that, that those also are the same sections of roads that um, Aquarian had uh, a CIP project planned for replacing their water lines. Mm -hmm. But at our request a couple of years ago, they, we had kicked it off a year because there was other things that had come up. And so for that reason, they still have work to do in there. Obviously, I now have work to do. And yes, we are have reached out to other contractors uh, who specialize in working in the, the wet. And um, we're awaiting contracts or proposals to do the work that we've discussed with them in the last week. Until I see it in paper, I not really should be really discussing it because I don't even know how much it would have cost. And one of the other things that we've done on top of that is, you know, we, I, we've talked with uh, Fred about how long do we have to spend these unanticipated monies and what they need to be spent for, and it was highways and bridges. So what we identified at both of those neighborhood meetings is that there's definitely a need to prepare studies. What is the cause? What can be done with recommendations? Because if we just start throwing darts at it, there's short-term things we can do to help, mm -hmm. but they're not solutions to the big problem. So this funding can't be used for the study. Okay. So I think that was, it, it needs to be used for the roadway actual work. So we're working to figure out what that funding is by doing the RFQ for the study. Right. And okay. then we're doing the pumping with our initial budgets. We're doing, you know, some of those other short term things, working on the websites the notices, the parking situations, right. um, getting answers to some of those questions that they've all been asking, you know, what can we do now, that are just things that we can do that aren't tied to funding. Um, okay, okay. But 
that's sort of where we stand with these roads being used for this money. That's perfect. That clears up my okay. what I had. Thank you. Rusty? Also, thank you. Rick? Yeah, I totally agree with what you just said, and I'm also uh, in favor of spending some of that money, if you can, for that roadway that's there. It's going to, we already know, it's going to be fixed one way or the other, I believe. Exactly. Yes. <clears throat> Bill? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you, Director, Assistant Director. Uh, I'm set. We need a motion to accept the money. Make a motion. Second. Yes, Regina. Just close the public hearing. I'll close the public hearing at, sorry, at 7-Eleven. Motion to accept the grant. Is that what you need? Accept the community yeah. block grant in the amount of? Two, $267,543.46. Second. Made by Regina, seconded by Rick. All in favor? It's unanimous. That's very good. Thank you. We're, we're up later, right? Right, but I wasn't sure, Fred, did you feel that, or us, uh, Chairman, um, we do have the paving bid that has come in uh, that was also in your folders because this would be awarded, this work would be awarded uh, to whoever we award the paving bid to. I didn't know if that was a good time to do this now or well do it we later in our... Mr. Chairman. Why don't we go to public comment and then we'll come Absolutely back. Absolutely fine. We're here. All right, we'll stay to the agenda, sort of. All right, thank you. All right, you. if you don't mind. All right, anybody here for public comment? Please state your name and your address. Mary Louise Woolsey, 148 Little River Road. I'm here to address a matter of continu uh, continuing concern regarding the illegal discharge of firearms on posted town land. I've brought this up before. I brought this up to Chief Sullivan several years back. He didn't seem terribly interested. I had a call from a resident of Mill Road a couple of weeks ago who asked me... May I, may I just a point of order, um, Mayor Lewis and Mr. Chairman. Uh, when we say that former Chief, Police Chief Sullivan wasn't particularly interested, we're talking about illegal use of firearms and discharge. I just want to not have those kind of comments made uh, about a former police chief or whether he was the police chief, because it's not suitable nor is it fair to well, Mr. Sullivan. Well, I will say that I have brought this to attention before. Um, I had a call from a resident of Mill Road a couple of weeks ago who asked me if there was any supervision of the firing range behind her property and I said there is no firing range on Mill Road. It's at the DPW. She said that they had at least two hours the, the previous night of firing uh, they could hear bang, bang, bang for two hours. She called the police department. Um, she asked me the following uh, day whether it would be proper protocol for someone from the police department to call back and say, thank you, ma'am, for your complaint. We looked into it or some type of response. That was not done. Uh, I bumped into Fred at the uh, ribbon cutting, whatever, uh, for the renovation at the academy and I mentioned the call and, and Fred knows the lady and she talked to him and she made three subsequent calls to the police department and a young a female officer did show up and talk to her stood in her yard in the daytime and could hear the bang bang pop pop uh, in the uh, land behind the property a um, week ago, last Monday morning, I did give Fred a call, um, left a message, very brief message. I said, Fred, Mary Louise here, would you mind calling me when you have a few minutes? Uh, he never did call back. Um, I was told by a member of the Conservation Commission that they had a big cleanup in June of that property. There's forest, town forest back there, conservation land back there, and a couple of private parcels. I was told that the public works uh, came and they were volunteers and that Chief Sawyer was there and they took out of that place um, trash, refrigerators, tires, and bullet casings. This is north of the Victory Garden where they found this. Um, I <laughs> went over today just to confirm. And if you go up Barber Road, you'll see where 
Uh, if you go up Mill Road, you'll see where Barber Road intersects, and then a couple of houses up there's a driveway with a gate at the end. And that's White's Lane. There's a nice sign posted for White's Lane. And there are signs back there on the left and the right, and the signs say, if you walk your dog, make sure he's on a leash, or make sure you pick up after your dog when you're in there. But the sign on the top right says, permissible for, um, says by the order of the Board of Selectmen, it says BOS, the discharge of firearms on town property is prohibited. And then there's a little sign below that says it's permissible for hunting during hunting season. So if you're a licensed hunter, you can go in there. I've about had it. I think the people on Mill Road have about had it. There is no excuse for not taking a look at what's happening on town property. That area tends to get neglected. I have complained about it before, but now I'm really growly complaining about it. Uh, we should not be treating town land that way. There is no excuse. Apparently people aren't putting the old cars there anymore. That's wonderful. But there's no excuse for the Conservation Commission and the Public Works Department to have to pick up those messes. And the, the, the poor woman is afraid to walk her dog for fear of getting shot. So I'm going to ask you, please, if you will be kind enough to look into this and for once make sure that that area is patrolled appropriately and the shooting on in the town forest and the Fine, Louise. yeah and White's Lane area I realize that but I'm serious about this yes, <laughs> the neighbors are really upset I thank you for your help thank you looks like the chief wants to make some public comment I would, uh, I'll make it as chief and also as a resident of the town okay. of Hampton I live on 5 Blake Lane which is yeah. right across yeah. um, I'm not sure what illegal shooting you're referring to because there is no illegal shooting. It's lawful. It is lawful to discharge a firearm as long as you're at least 300 feet away from an occupied structure in the state of New Hampshire. The location where the shooting is going, yes, I was. I actually volunteered and went out. Uh, the <coughs> Public Works was nice enough to loan me a truck uh, that we could take bottle loads of trash in and out of there. Um, it's not unlawful. So, uh, these folks were explaining that on Mill Road. I know the officer that went because I spoke to the officer because I heard the same shooting. I, again, I live closer to it than the folks on Mill Road do. It is not unlawful. People can shoot in there. Are they being nice about it and leaving their trash? Absolutely. I went in there with a group uh, led by Chris Valhouli. Uh, Attorney Chris Valhouli went, went in there with a group of people and we cleaned up the shooting range uh, back in June. It was about a dozen of us. Pulled three truckloads of trash out. There has since been some folks that are weaving their shotgun shells and all that there, but the place they're shooting is absolutely lawful for them to shoot. So as far as the sign that says the Board of Selectmen, which you'll find if you do any research, there was never actually a vote of the Board of Selectmen to prohibit that because they can't vote to prohibit that. That would take a warrant article by the town body to prohibit that shooting on conservation land. So somebody put that up on the sign because somebody gave that to me and Fred. We looked it up. As far as we can find, the board has never taken a vote to prohibit shooting on conservation land because they can't. So because somebody posted somewhere, it doesn't make it true. Okay, a little bit of that fake news going on. All right, so the shooting going on, so I just want to make sure I get this out because it was pretty adamant that what we're doing here, with the, the town employees, again, aren't doing their job here, which is absolutely false. I took my own time with my daughter to go in there and help with that. And DPW does their part. Conservation Commission did a great job putting this together. So to come in here and drop that out the way they did without doing a little homework, I'm a little, a little dismayed at that. I don't think that's accurate and it's fair to the folks that were involved. Thank you. Mary Louise, we'll public comment. We're not going to have back it's, and forth. But it, it's important. What? Just give, just I'm going to give you one minute. Humor me one minute. Better. A, why is that sign there? Somebody must know it's posted. All right? And B, shooting at 10 o'clock at night for two hours straight? I'm sorry. that I, There's a problem here. I'm okay. going to ask you to look at Thank it. Thank you. I, All right. I, I, wait, wait, wait. We're not going to public comment. We don't go back and forth on public comment. So anybody else in the public wishing to speak? I uh, would like to grab the mic, Mr. Chairman, as uh, public comment for uh, legislative business, sir. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll uh, try and speak. This is not to do with that. 
Uh, this has to do with my own agenda, okay. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I speak as a, a member of the legislature, and I wanted to discuss two important uh, uh, council and uh, committee appointments. One we will uh, bring up later on uh, the uh, uh, pollution and the uh, cancer cluster with Mindy Messner's sponsorship. First one is uh, July 31st, 2017, from the Speaker of the House uh, to various recipients. I am one of them, and is to uh, announce the appointments to the Seacoast Cancer Cluster Investigation. And while it's summer, uh, these are important issues. This will be applicable under new, uh, new business tonight with the uh, Eversource PUC. Uh, I will be uh, making a motion to appoint uh, via Rainy Cushing, Representative Cushing's letter, for him to be appointed by this board. It establishes a commission on the Seacoast Cancer Cluster, and I'll be very brief about both of these, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> the general court recognizes that the Department of Health and Human Services found on February 2nd, 2016, the existence of the first cancer cluster ever identified in the state of New Hampshire. Specifically, the department found higher than expected incidences of two forms of pediatric cancer in a five-town area. Therefore, the general court establishes the committee to investigate and analyze the findings and related materials. So it's a very important uh, 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 body that will be meeting in the middle of summer. Representative Messner uh, has done extraordinary work. The day the governor brought down the $270,000 in change, we had a three-hour meeting in Concord. Representative Michael Edgar was there, Rainey was there, Representative Cushing, uh, Representative Jim McConnell, Representative Messner, and myself. Uh, and the, the word to both the EPA and to the Department of Environmental Services is that uh, they need to speed it up, they need to take this issue more seriously, they need to do bedrock monitoring, and they need to do groundwater. And I know Mr. Welch is going to have some points about this. Again, I'll be making that motion for Representative Cushing later. Second, we have talked about uh, state parks. Mr. Griffin will look at my laptop there and find in the middle of summer for weeks and weeks on end that Lake Sunapee, which is leased to a, a big, huge hedge fund, is the, uh, um, uh, the face saver, if you will, on the division of state parks in New Hampshire, middle of summer. You can't find Hampton on it. Uh, it's been problematic. The leadership of Dredd, you know my position. From the Speaker of the House, July 31st, to uh, five uh, representatives, I am one of them, and it is pursuant to House Bill uh, 488. They are establishing a commission, and it is his pleasure to announce those people. It's establishing a state parks advisory council. The council, and now this is codified in law, where we don't have to beg and ask and, 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 and squeal for money, but it empowers us to uh, give advice to the director of Division of Parks, review existing statutes, capital appropriations relating to the park system, recommend to the general court, any changes that needed to be improved, efficiencies that need to be improved, and review, this is important, with the uh, uh, assistance of the Attorney General, all agreements, memoranda of understanding, leases, special use permits, deeds, and other legal documents to which the Division of Parks and Recreation or the Department of Resources and Economic Development or both are a party. On uh, this the public is, comment, you've got to wrap it up now. Yeah, it, well, this is important. We're talking okay, cancer clusters. And this, this, is big, this is big more stuff, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold the floor for a second. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, Sunapi, which is featured there, um, is now leased, as we have saw it, by a uh, hedge fund, and, and they've been fined $412 million by the United States government for foreign services corrupt practices, and they are the ones that have the traffic on the computer for the state park system. They're fined by the federal government, and they're leasing the state park. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anybody else from the public wishing to speak? Seeing none, we will move to announcements and community <coughs> calendar. Uh, Selectman Barnes. I have nothing, Mr. Chairman. One of the things we had in town last week was we had a dedication or an, an opening of a state of a playground, pocket playground over at Five Corners. <clears throat> and uh, those citizens who haven't seen that yet, I would suggest you go over and take a look at it. It is a great little playground. Um, there, it was a cooperative effort by some businesses in town, by our Parks and Recs Department, by um, uh, the Lions Club. So, uh, again, it was a cooperative effort amongst, again, a bunch of people to get that park done. It has come out so well that the uh, rec director is now looking at doing a similar one up at, up at uh, Lock Road, the other end of Lock Road. 
uh, on that park there too. So we may be hearing some more about that shortly. Mr. Griffin. No, it looks like they're having a great season at the beach, finally. Mr. Bean. Love that playground, Rusty. Thanks for those comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I think we should, uh, on that playground, give thanks to the rec department. They did a lot of work on that. And there were individual businesses that provided a lot of the labor yep. from down the beach. Uh, Bernie's, Wally's, uh, the goat, I believe, provided most of the labor to put that in. And the Lions Club was the other one that really did a lot of work on that. Platinum fence. So, about the fence, yes. Yeah, so it's platinum a, fence. Uh, platinum salt, fence, yeah. okay. So it's a beautiful park. It's, it's uh, great to go visit it. Okay, moving on. Consent agenda. Hampton Cemetery Deeds, Cable Committee Appointment, Richard Cantor. Entertainment license, new owner, Terrence Dion. Millie's on L Street, 17 L Street, request of no objection for restaurant, cocktail liquor license, RSA 178 colon 22. Terrence Didani. Didani. Okay, I'm sorry. Didani. Man or ma ma member, manager, Millie's on L Street, 17 L Street. One day entertainment license, the gather to end hunger festival at Smutty Nose, 827. Parade and public gathering licenses, firefighters pipe band parade, 821. The gather to end hunger festival at Smutty Nose, 827. Reach the beach, beer tent, Rotary Club on Hampton, 916. Smutty Nose Rock Fest Half Marathon uh, Dash 5K 1001 Seafood Festival si uh, Sidewalk Vendor Permits uh, Palm Psychic Reading Beach Basics BZ Gifts BZ Beach Supply Dudley's Jewel Box Tibet uh, Boutique Tibet Boutique Nam's Gift Shop The Surf Market Zach's Barn Mrs. Mitchell's Country Shop uh, can I have a, I have a so moved. motion? So moved by Phil, seconded by Rusty. I'd just like to say a quick, okay. quick point on on the cable committee appointment. Yep. Uh, Mr. Cantor, I met him the other day. He uh, at the cable committee meeting. Uh, he has recently moved to town. Uh, he is retired. He's been helping out uh, Brian out back, straighten out a lot of the stuff. Uh, the gentleman comes with a very uh, impressive uh, background in in TV and um, private systems. So I'm sure he's going to be a great help to that committee. Okay, very good. And you seconded the Phil's yep, motion? Second. All in favor? Okay, consent count agenda passes. Approval of minutes, July 10th, 2017. <laughs> correction and approval. Everybody has seen the correction? Yep. So moved. <clears throat> All in favor? Okay. July 24th, 2017. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Good. Appointments. Chief Sawyer, Police Department, Departmental Update. Welcome, Chief. Good Welcome, evening. Deputy Dodd. Hobbs. God. Dog. <laughs> Come on, I didn't. Freudian sweat. Freudian sweat. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Motion to adjourn. <laughs> I know some money to the budget for some counseling for the deputy. <laughs> Good evening. This is the uh, second quarter review, and I, I just took a little bit of a different tack with it. I know we do it by quarters a lot. Um, from this point forward, what I hope to do is we're just going to keep doing it by the current state of this time of year. Last year, we, uh, we were comparing it to the previous quarter of the same year. I want to do it by the half year, three quarters. I think it just gives you a better overall picture of the activity we're experiencing. And this is dated uh, today to the board. Current staffing level for full time is 34 sworn. On June 17th, we began our summer season. Officer Jason Jackson, Vitaly Sorokins, and Matthew Robinson were selected to serve as corporals. The corporal serve as a direct supervisors for our part time special officers during our busiest times at the beach. HPD has continued to utilize three corporals this year due to the increasing levels of visitors to the beach and the decreasing levels of experience within our part-time special officer ranks. Officer Jay Papalato and Officer Brandon Whitehead are currently finishing the 173rd New Hampshire Police Academy, graduating very shortly here on August 18th. Upon graduation, both officers will return to the patrol division to complete a field training program. 
On July 24th, Special Part-Time Officer Justin LaDuke was appointed as a full-time officer and will attend the 175th New Hampshire Police Academy commencing in January of 2018. Our current part-time staffing level is uh, 32 sworn. We currently have 32 part-time officers on our roster. Five part-time officers are currently on leaves of absence, bringing the number of working part-time officers to 27. As far as I can tell, that's the slowest number we've had in my time uh, here in Hampton. Of the working part-time officers, 11 are on probationary status with less than two years of service to the department. As you may recall, we began the season with nine new officers. Even with the new officers, our part-time officer ranks continue to be depleted as they are hired for a full-time positions here and other departments. Uh, currently, we have hired three this year. Uh, Massachusetts State Police has two, and they're waiting on a word of a third. UNH has taken two, and Manchester has taken two, and I'm waiting to hear uh, on a background check for one of our officers going potentially to Salem. So we continue to produce some of the best police officers in the state, but everybody wants them. Uh, so we'll probably be talking in the future about some ways to try to remedy that situation. Recruitment. On April 8th, we began the testing process for part-time officer candidates to attend a part-time officer academy starting in August. The department received 206 applications for the test, 30 actually, 36 actually registered for the test, and between dropouts and withdrawals during the screening questionnaire, 25 applicants took the written test. After the written test, 19 successful applicants moved on to the physical agility test. At the conclusion of the physical agility test, 11 applicants were extended an invitation to an oral board interview. Those candidates who successfully completed the interview were given conditional office of employment and began the next phase of hiring process, which included a thorough background investigation, polygraph examination, and psychological evaluation. After this extensive process, the department has enrolled two recruits for the part-time academy beginning on August 12th. The department's next part-time officer testing process will com commence on October 7th. The test is going to be right there at Hampton PD. Anyone interested in employment with the Hampton Police Department should visit our website, hamptonpd.com, and file an application electronically. This testing process will be for placement in the Part-Time Officer Academy beginning on February 3rd, 2018. Operations, and we did extend the quarter out to include the 4th of July. <clears throat> Ongoing issues with heroin, uh, heroin have plagued the region. Hampton has overdose deaths attributed to the openings for the first half of 2017. Uh, that was three. Another death occurred in early July, which brings the year total to four overdose deaths. We continue to work uh, with local, state, and federal partners to combat the issue. Our preseason beach activity was slower than last year due to the wet and cool weather experienced in the region. Our officers did an outstanding job maintaining order during the, the hot, busy days that we did incur when schools across the region have skip days and the students will t descend upon Hampton Beach. We've continued the program of bringing in experienced officers from other municipalities to augment our staffing levels. And this has proven to be very helpful in maintaining order and providing for good traffic flow through the beach area. The weekend of the 4th of July was challenging as the weather was warm and sunny. Large crowds came to the beach for the entire weekend leading up to the 4th. The department made 136 arrests from Saturday to Tuesday the 4th. Otherwise, a reasonably quiet and safe holiday weekend was celebrated due to the many officers who came in on extra duty to provide for public safety. Special thanks to the New Hampshire State Police, the Rockingham County Sheriff's Department, University of New Hampshire Police Department, Epping Police Department, Exeter Police Department, and the 12th uh, Civil Support Group uh, team, uh, who all provided personnel and equipment to assist with the preseason and busy 4th of July holiday. I'd also like to thank the Seabrook Police Department for the continued cooperation and coordination of traffic control along the Ocean Boulevard corridor. Assistance was also re received from New Hampshire DOT, uh, allowing the use of the variable message boards as part of our traffic control plan for the holiday weekend. I'd like to thank each of those communities and agencies for their generosity, which greatly assisted the Hampton Police Department with a successful traffic control plan. With the 4th of July holiday behind us, we continue with our summer operation. This will include the continued training and acclimation of our new officers. With good weather, we anticipate large crowds of beachgoers uh, like we experienced Sunday and those attending assorted entertainment venues. The department also continues its operational planning for the many special events scheduled out to the fall to include Children's Week, Labor Day weekend, Seafood Festival, and a number of the other events that you just highlighted in your consent agenda. Our activity uh, compared to last, if you can look down there, most things are down, uh, which I'm happy to see. One of the areas that I'm happy to see is up is our motor vehicle stops. Uh, they're up 2%. 
we're on pace to beat last year, which was a great year. It's, it was the top year we had in the last 12 years for motor vehicle stops. That means the officers, when they're not tied up with the calls, are being out there being very proactive, making motor vehicle stops and trying to identify uh, impaired drivers and other crimes that may be coming in uh, by vehicle. DWI uh, is down slightly. It says 7%, but that's really only a difference of 4 compared to last year. Um, our felonies is significant. It's down, uh, considerably down 33%. I'm happy about that. Parking tickets are down, but I attribute that also to the weather, and we're also down one person in our, uh, our parking ticket team. We had two gentlemen, retired folks that were doing it, and one of them switched over to that uh, evidence tech position that we had, and we were unable to find a suitable candidate to backfill that position. So we're down to Mr. Hamlin. Uh, he's out there all the time, but also the weather, I think, has had a, a little bit to do with it early in the season. Um, also attached, you'll see I provided you with uh, state statistics based on our site plans that we have in our uh, record system. The first one is January to... Um, July 31st, and then you'll have the uh, quarter, April 1st to July. Uh, nothing outrageous. It's the same kind of tempo that you've seen before with our activity down, primarily in the state park for ma order maintenance issues. And I'll take any questions from the board. Thank you. Uh, questions, we'll start over here. Phil. Chief, you're in the middle of summer. Go get them. Thank you. Keep it safe. God bless your people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Griffin. Um, I will say that I also had uh, people that have commented on the uh, White's Lane area. Um, but what I'm thinking, if this is uh, conservation land, um, isn't there a problem with the lead bullets in the conservation area? I mean, I'm not against the hunting, but maybe there shouldn't be used as a, as a, a firing range where they're going to have and, and that Rick, that's a question that many people ask, and, and uh, folks from the Conservation Commission, we've talked about it. Um, right now, there is no prohibition, lawful prohibition. It's legal for them to shoot in there. Those issues you're raising could certainly be raised. I, I understand that maybe a group of like-minded citizens that are going to propose a uh, citizen-sponsored warrant article to prohibit shooting uh, in that area. Mm -hmm. um, they're okay with the, the folks I've talked to are okay with the hunting. But the uh, pleasure shooting, the target shooting, and those are the folks that are leaving the trash everywhere. Uh, and it is, it is somewhat dangerous out there simply because so many people use that, the town forest now. Right. So those are issues I think that the, uh, the governing body, the folks, the, the, the citizens may need to make a decision yeah. on that. And I think that's the right way to go for a citizen's warrant article. But I think we're going to need to get input from the Conservation Commission about the lead factor. Cause I think we, they're prepared we, for that. Yeah, we've heard about the... Uh, that there are issues in other towns with firing ranges. If you're firing anywhere near and you're near an aquifer or anything like that, it has to do with the water supply, that certainly could be a concern. So but I'll leave that area. to people that know more about that to answer. I'm no. really keen. I'm not that up to speed on that yeah. particular part of this issue. Okay. I'll, if I have something else, I'll ask after. Regina? Um, the, so drug offenses, that's just, is that just like catching people with drugs? Or that does, like as far as heroin goes, do you think that it's better than it was last year or worse? I think we're uh, better equipped to deal with it. As you remember, we became part of a, a, a joint operation with the Portsmouth Police Department in Greenland uh, under the Granite Hammer grant money. And we've been highly effective uh, identifying folks that are using it here and trying to trace it back to the source, which is generally down, I don't want to use names, but it's probably about 40 miles from here. Right, okay. Uh, south of the border. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. We all know what Got it you. is, and we've been very effective in dealing with that. Right. We're expanding uh, our portion of that. Uh, we've brought in Newington, and potentially Seabrook's going to join us, because we're, what we're finding is these things don't know borders. So if we do a great job in Hampton of pushing it out, right. it lands somewhere else. So we're trying to be <coughs> good neighbors and trying to help other agencies and other departments that may not have been part of our grant and as long as the chief uh, gives us the okay then we send our folks in with uh, under mutual aid jurisdiction and we are making a lot of arrests at the low level which gives us the opportunity to trace it back right. with cooperation from folks and try to get back to the sources so we, I, I think we're we've got a better handle on it but the problem is is we, we've still had four opiate right. deaths in this mm -hmm. town and, but I still feel we're doing. Uh, we have a better handle on the job. I just think it's a much more coordinated effort. Great job, so, thanks, Chief thank and Deputy Chief and all of HPD. Trustee, 
No, just uh, been down the beach many times, and I drive through there a lot, and you guys seem to be doing a good job. Doesn't seem like I see as many as we used to see on the beach. And because you're not. <laughs> because we're not. But it still seems that, uh, you know, the, the ones that are there are doing a good job. The, uh, the fencing, I think, has done a great job on, on curbing people just walking out in the street, and I think that's helped a lot. So, uh, good job this summer. Well, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, I know it's later in the agenda. If you want to have a discussion on the fence issue now, I'm fine with her, unless you want me to wait. No, we can have it in a minute. Can I do my question? Sure. Nobody ever lets me do my question. Well, you just want to listen <laughs> to me right, right off, you know, <laughs> just because I mistook the deputy, deputy, you know, the deputy. <laughs> Um, what is your ideal staffing, both full and part-time? I will be coming to the board sometime in the near future with a proposal for additional full-time personnel. Um, as you remember, we had a PERF study done back in 1988. Um, now, a lot of our operation deals with the beach operation. Let's face it, we, we deal with massive crowds. And the beach has changed, and I'll say this, I've, I've been on that beach since 1979, either living or working. And I think it's changed for the better. Um, but also wearing that hat as emergency management, I look at the potential if something were to happen, how we would we respond to that, to an, an incident where we needed to either get people out of there or assets there to deal with a major issue. Um, so a lot of it comes down to issues of managing the traffic control and, and the crowds. So ideally if we could have part-time personnel, which is to the benefit of the taxpayer, if we could get our numbers up to you know the 50 to 55 range, we would be that would be great. But we've been operating around that 30 to 35 number for a number of years, and it just the reason we keep hovering at that number is if we hire nine people, I'll be lucky if I have four of them left for next summer, because there's such a uh, depletion in the ranks of law enforcement across the state. I was reading an article today, um, just timing. The uh, New Hampshire State Police, who we work with a lot, but we haven't seen a lot of down here this year because they have the same problem we do, they just swore in 14 new troopers on Friday. 14. And one swearing in. I've never seen anything like that. I've never seen that many troopers at one time getting sworn in. Um, you look at Manchester, you look at Nashville, you look at Salem, everybody is dealing with the same issue um, of trying to find people. And, you know, you, you saw me go through the... Uh, the process that we ran over 200 candidates and we wound up with two for part-time positions based on all the standards that were required to meet by the state. Um, it, it's getting difficult. Uh, it's getting difficult for full-time, let alone we're offering a little bit of a lesser value as far as pay goes as a part-time position. It's only, you know, primarily seasonal. So we have to come up with some other ways to look at things. So I am going to be coming to the board with a proposal uh, in the near future regarding full-time personnel, because uh, right now I don't anticipate what we've been seeing over the last five years to change in the foreseeable future. It's just the way that the, we are as a country towards this profession, and we haven't missed that in the state of New Hampshire or regionally. We're, we're all struggling to, to find bodies to come in and do this, this type of work, and it's just not very popular right now. Yeah, um, great to see DWI is down, even if it's only by four. It's still anything down. I think good. that's an improvement. As, as small as that is, uh, when you look at, we really pursue that. We don't want impaired drivers out there. Let's face it, we run a very big entertainment zone down there, and a lot of people are down there and vibing and having a good time. What you do see is a change, though, when you, when you drive along Ocean Boulevard and outside any of the bars or the clubs, you see the Ubers. The Uber cars are just, uh, have been really, I know there was a lot of people up in the air about that. Portsmouth had a thing about they were going to ban them. Uh, I think it's actually helped us out greatly. I, I see fewer people driving cars down there, yet you still see the establishments with full crowds. Fewer people walking out and getting behind the wheel on their own. They're, they're having somebody do the driving for them or they're staying there. So I think that's good for us and it's good for the business owners. So I it think is. that's been a win. And it's a shame to see the, the parking tickets down. But I can report I did see the chief giving a parking ticket. He saw me so writing a couple. A couple of parking tickets, <laughs> so he's out there doing his job. Mr. Griffin. I knew I had one more thing I wanted to say, um, and it did have to do with those fences. I've had several, uh, there's a few people that don't like them, but there's many people that do like them. 
and uh, it's amazed me that so many of those people have come forward to, you know, I told them it was your idea and that I wanted to thank you for bringing that forward and uh, yeah. people have noticed. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate so, that. I wanted to say that. Um, the fence? Yeah. yeah. Sure. The, the fence has been one of those projects I've been working on since back to my days as Deputy Chief uh, under the good graces of Chief Sullivan uh, led me to explore other ways to try to deal with the issues we're dealing with, with with technology and equipment as opposed to manpower. And I just remember on the 4th of July back in those times that one, you know, if you know me on the 4th of July, I'm usually right at D Street. I'm right there because that's kind of the linchpin to make everything else move. And I would be there and I'd have to take 10 officers just to keep the crowd out of the road from D Street to C Street. That's how thick the crowd was. Yeah. So as we move forward, uh, I want to say it was probably seven or eight years ago, we bought a small, you know, small section of fence just to cover that area as a test. When we first put it up, it was met with mixed reactions. Some business people hated it, some people loved it. Um, as we progressed, we started borrowing some fence to make it run all the way down in front of the casino from Lawrence, Mass. They were kind enough to loan us uh, some of their fence because we would loan ours to them for some of their festivals, and it was a good relationship. But as we saw our ranks dwindling, um, I felt that it was a time to really try to make that a sustainable program throughout the summer and extend it. Because from my point of view, having lived, grown up down there and having lived just over the bridge and having to travel that road every day back when I lived over on Seabrook Beach, that was the tie-up. You would sit in traffic until you got to the, to the casino, and once you got past the casino, you went. It was, it was just, that was the area that I knew we had to work on. So I began some discussions uh, through the assistance of uh, Senator Stiles. She helped put a meeting together um, with Commissioner Sheehan from DOT. Um, great lady, she really knows her stuff, and she was very open-minded about my proposal. Uh, I also met uh, with Phil Bryce uh, and Commissioner Rose on the east side of the road for Dread to put some of the fence on their sidewalk because we, you know, even though it's the state of New Hampshire, as we know, they don't always communicate uh, amongst themselves as, a, as state entities. Their, their borders meet our borders, and so you have to talk to everybody involved. And they were on board with it. They thought it would be a good idea to try to keep people out of the roadway, so that's why you see the fence on the east side the whole length of the band, band shell. So putting that up there, uh, I did meet with one of the DOT engineers. They did express some concerns. The town has received a letter uh, reinforcing those concerns, and I respect them. Uh, it was one of those situations where it's very close to the line. Uh, they would prefer to see it farther away from the yellow line down there on the roadway, particularly in front of the casino. The problem we have with that is then that interferes with commerce, uh, people getting their deliveries, because right now from the length of the fence from G Street, all the way to uh, up to the corner where Ashworth is, you can fit a uh, truck behind that to make their deliveries. What we've also instructed the officers is that, you know, if people are making their deliveries early in the morning and it's a large commercial carrier that can't get behind there, I allow them to park in that first lane. The fence is very easily moved. It's a lightweight galvanized aluminum. We did that on purpose so we could move it if we needed to for the businesses or emergency purposes. And I allow the businesses to break the fence open in the area they need the delivery as long as they guarantee to put it back. And they have, I haven't found the fence separated or in pieces all over the road. They've been very good about it. Uh, mostly positive from the businesses in that area. Uh, I've spoken to Chief Ayotte. They do have some concerns uh, just as they're trying to progress through the beach area if they have to go to emergency. Their concern is it gives the vehicles less room to pull to the sides. I respect and understand that, but think of the past when the cars used to pull to the side, they were pulling into the crowds. That's what, that's what we're trying to avoid. And, and they kind of understand it, that it's a short distance until you get to where the meter patrol is, and then there's room on the right, and we can get people out of the way. So it does keep the traffic flowing early. I estimate that on a busy Sunday, we're shaving 20 to 30 minutes off of the commute northbound from the bridge to the Ashworth. I only know that because I used to live there, and I used to travel that all the time. I've taken the time to come down on some Sundays on days off to travel just to see what the route is like. And it's been roughly 20 to 30 minutes we've shaved off that time because of that section of fence. So there's some negatives to it. Um, we're working through those. Um, Assistant uh, Town Manager Sullivan had the opportunity to speak with the governor, I believe, here during the meeting um, and brought the issue up in the letter we received. 
I had a subsequent uh, follow-up meeting Wednesday at the Governor's Council meeting when the Governor came in and he put me and the uh, Commissioner again together. And I'm confident that they've raised some issues. Uh, I'm confident that we'll work through the issues and make this work again for next year. Uh, it, one point that was talked about is taking the fence down just because of the concerns. I think we've alleviated those for this season and I do not plan on taking the fence down until probably Thursday or Friday before Labor Day. And the reason we have to take that down at, at that timing is Labor Day is Monday and the Seafood Festival will start setting up Tuesday and we have to have it out of the way by the time they start setting up because it will get in the way. So that's all I have on the fence. If there's any questions or concerns, Good. I'd be clear. Anybody have any questions Video? on the fence? Other than it's worked great. Yeah, yeah I think yeah, it worked great too. I guess when you drive down there, you can, you can see it. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's a big improvement. Huge. Chief, uh, you, you heard earlier, um, if I may, Mr. Chairman, yeah. uh, and uh, the chairman wanted to get right down to business. I know he wanted to, to uh, get to this issue with great celerity. Uh, I've, I've read uh, the July 20th letter from a David Rodriguez. Spent uh, time in a three-hour meeting uh, with uh, the EPA uh, and the um, uh, staff uh, leader at Department of Environmental Services about carcinogens that imperil our water supply potentially. Uh, and they seem to be more, more concerned about uh, supervising and micromanaging your performance of duty down there, and these are my words, not yours, uh, about the fence uh, than they are about uh, our water supply. Uh, you've seen that um, Lake Sunapee, a state park that generates no revenue other than that per the lease agreement, is on the computer system for that state park uh, to a firm that's a Wall Street hedge fund that's been fined 400 and something million dollars for foreign corrupt practices. That's in Libya, that's in Africa. It's bad stuff. Uh, not impressed with a lot of the leadership I see, operationally, in Concord. I have full confidence in what you do with the State Park. We'll be discussing uh, indemnification uh, later on this month uh, for the fire services we provide there. The new council, the advisory council, will have us take a real strong look at what exactly goes on at State Parks. And uh, you and I have served together in the past. Uh, we, the three of us have served in a, a, a gun club, an organization, uh, on national and international levels. And uh, much more so than Mr. Rodrigue from the Department of Transportation and uh, Brian Schutt uh, and William Watson, um, who I seldom see in Hampton except for um, dog and ponies, if you will. Um, I have much more confidence in your capabilities, and uh, you do what you want, and if you need this board support, and my support as a legislator, um, or anybody else from the Hampton delegation, you just please let us know. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> no, that's Sorry, Deputy. Apologize. <laughs> I'm good. It's all worse. Chief told me to do that. <laughs> uh, you keep on bringing it up, Jim. Just let it die. You know. <laughs> How's the chicken? That's what I was waiting for. <laughs> While retiring, soon to retire animal control officer has quite a sense of humor. Decided it was time to let some wildlife loose in my office as I was trying to work on document for you guys. <laughs> so there is a picture going around, I'm sure Rusty can tell you is the chicken took over the chief desk. All right. <laughs> Rusty, make sure you share it. Uh, Next, we have DPW. But do you guys mind if we? I'm looking out here at the sea, at the seafood festival people, and Doc and John and I have fallen asleep. They're so old here. <laughs> so, do you mind if we put them on first? <laughs> okay. So, John, Doc, and you brought some youth with you. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. Right, you two. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, can we have the young lady? Uh, yeah, have the young lady join them. And in introduce her, please. Introduce yourselves. <laughs> because we know who's probably doing all the work. <laughs> There's no question about it. As, as is the case all the time. We've all heard the expression, where does the time go? 28th year of seafood festival for this community. What really amazes me, I've been involved for 17 years, wow. and I thought it was going to be three or four initially. But in any event, as you folks know, we've all been involved with the Seafood Festival for so many years, and so many changes are taking place from the original 
many years ago was at State Park for one day, and that particular one day was proof of where we are today. And uh, we have a new general chairman, general chairperson is well known. I don't believe uh, he needs any uh, formal introduction because he's faced this uh, board many, many times on many other issues and other uh, events as well. But I uh, obviously want to welcome on behalf of the Hampton area, Chamber of Commerce, which it is a Chamber of Commerce event, uh, John Nyan, who has taken over this year. Having sat with John on many, many cases, I can tell you from a fact that for, he might call himself new at the job, or a rookie, if you will, but he has been full steam, steam ahead on this because coming in cold turkey for an event of this magnitude, in all honesty, takes a heck of a lot behind, behind the scenes. And I just want to speak on behalf of the Hampton Area Chamber of the job that John has done up to this point, and I'm sure they will continue therefore. So with uh, that in mind, needless to say, I don't think he needs a formal introduction. John Nyan, our general chairperson of the 28th uh, Hampton Beach Seafood Festival. John. Thank you, Doc, and the commission check will be in, in the uh, Thank you very much. I was hoping you would do that. Well, first of all, thank you for, for having us here tonight. Um, as you know, the 28th Seafood Festival is scheduled for September 8th through the 10th. Um, and as always, the Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors appreciates all of the support that we get from the town of Hampton, especially all of the departments that uh, put on this uh, great community event. Being in my rookie year uh, as chairperson, uh, I've been working very closely with the Hampton Police Department, Hampton Fire, DPW Building Department to make sure that I and, and we understood all of the town requirements and expectations. That was critical to me and we met with all of those department heads early on. I'm pleased to report that we have ob obtained all of our special permits, our licenses from the town, the state, and the Liquor Commission. I actually sat at the uh, Liquor Commission training for four hours up in Concord to get my certificate. Um, I'm also uh, planning on having some additional meetings, as you well probably can understand, the logistical final details with all of the departments of the town. Uh, the general event details, um, we have a website, Hampton Beach Seafood Festival. Uh, anybody can go online and, and look at all the things that are taking place. We also uh, submitted uh, to the town of Hampton through Channel 22, <coughs> graciously accepted our uh, six, seven slides uh, presentation that will be airing on Channel 22 uh, uh, as of tomorrow. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, once again, we have a spectacular event planned. Uh, over 50 uh, Seacoast top restaurants, 60 arts and craft vendors, hundreds of Ocean Boulevard merchants offering uh, end of season sidewalk sales. And we have continuous entertainment on two stage with 15 bands and, and, and orchestras. We also be bringing back this year, due to popular demand, a lobster roll eating contest, which will be on Saturday at 2 p.m., a fireworks shoot uh, on Saturday at 8.15 p.m., and a thrilling uh, skydiving extravaganza by skydivers of New England on Sunday at 5 p.m. What's new this year? Um, one of the things that when I first chatted with Doc and, and the board uh, about my coming on, um, I shared with him that I had some personal goals uh, of getting the community back involved into the Seafood Festival. Um, we've done some of that, uh, but we've also made some changes and enhancements to what I think is going to be a good event. The first thing is that we downsized Kitty Land. Uh, Children's Festival is just around the corner, and we feel that Children's Festival is the place for Hampton Beach to be involved in, in Kitty activities. Uh, so we've downsized Kitty Land, uh, but we have kept two vendors, two special vendors, the little train that goes around, because that's very, very popular, and, and Kono Ice, which is also popular. And by doing that, we have relocated the culinary tent to the Kitty Land area. One of the things that, in talking with um, Pat Whitley, who handles the uh, culinary tent for us, and all of the chef demonstrations, he, he said to me, the first thing he wanted, can I get a bigger space? And as you know, the culinary tent was down near uh, the food tent area. So we were able to satisfy their needs by giving them a bigger tent and also kind of a special area of the, uh, the seafood festival. Along with continuing to provide a role for the area Knights of Columbus uh, at our mission and gate, 
Uh, we've also brought back the Rotary Club of Hampton uh, to handle and manage and staff the Barefoot um, sponsored Beach Cabana Bar. Um, we've also connected with Winnicott High School, asking for their involvement with the help of school principal Bill McGowan and his team. Uh, we were able to establish a role of an intern, Taylor here. Taylor is a uh, senior at Winnicott High School. Uh, she's part of what they call the Extended Learning Opportunities Program. Um, she's been on board since uh, school ended, uh, working 15 to 20 hours a week. And as Doc mentioned, uh, thank God for her because she has done an awful lot of work. Um, and we've given her the opportunity to train her into what it's like to run a seafood festival and all of the major uh, aspects of that festival. Along with Taylor, we've also connected with Winnicott High School and uh, brought in the ROTC team. Uh, and they will be acting as our crossing guards at the south gate of the uh, Seafood Festival, working with the Hampton PD. Um, and then finally, uh, we have, uh, for the national anthem uh, for the Seafood Festival, we've selected a uh, uh, young lady uh, from the Winnicott High School choral group. Connecting with the town, um, as much as we can and, and more than we've done in the past was important to me also. So one, I've contracted with the town through Parks and Rec to provide handicap shuttle services uh, from the uh, town hall parking lot uh, to the north gate of the festival, uh, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Second, we've successfully recruited to work with us on our management <coughs> committee team, individuals from both your departments and boards uh, that will, I believe, bring add value very quickly to the festival. Third, it's my philosophy that we hire paid supervisors and laborers for both setup and, and during the festival, that we first reach out to the local known workforce and offer them part-time opportunities. With the approval of the Director of Public Works, we have and will continue to reach out to town employees to provide short-term supplemental employment working opportunities with the festival while not on working on the town clock. Now, along with the paid, paid workforce, we have been able to successfully fill most key positions within the different festival venues by volunteers. Uh, it's amazing to read emails from volunteers that have been volunteering their times for years and years and years and actually look and take the education around volunteering at the Seafood Festival. Uh, we will have a total of 400 individuals as volunteers, um, and uh, we still have a couple of volunteer positions to fill on Sunday. So if anybody's interested, you can go to uh, uh, our volunteer hotline, which is 603-502-5411. We also offer free parking and shuttle services. First Student, once again, is our partner, and they will be offering free shuttle services from 13 in-town satellite parking lots. Um, Admissions have not changed this year. It's $5 Friday, $10 Saturday, and $8 on Saturday. Children under 12 are free. This all includes free parking, free shuttle, free entertainment, free fireworks, culinary chef demonstration, and skydiving. The real reason we're here tonight is like over the past 15 years, uh, for us to proceed with our same procedures, we need this board's approval on four areas. First is the traffic pattern from Ashworth Avenue to Ocean Boulevard. Thank you. Uh, this traffic plan is essentially the same plan that has been implemented for the last 15 years at the encouragement of the Hampton PD, Department of, uh, of State of New Hampshire, Hampton uh, Police, Fire, Department, Public Works. Um, and it sets in bullets, I won't read all of them, but it sets in bullets the different things that we would need in terms of changing the traffic pattern. Second, we request closure of A to H Street at Ocean Boulevard for admission purposes. Uh, three, town parking lots. We ask uh, the town to keep the uh, parking lots uh, open because we have a lot of individuals, vendors, and volunteers that park in those lots that do not get out until after the festival is over. So I would ask you to, to keep um, the parking lots open if you possibly can. And then finally, a uh, request use for message boarding for traffic information. And we need two, one message board that would be located at the old Lupo's to state left lane buses only. Um, and then the other on 101 west of Landing Road stating free parking and shuttle service with arrows pointing left. I am more than happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. 
um, and I do request that uh, our, uh, our traffic and, and, and parking um, is, is addressed by the board and, and voted on by the selectmen. Thank you. Regina. I make the motion that we uh, give them what they need. Okay, yeah, let's go through everybody. Rusty, you're abstaining, I'm right? Abstaining. Rick? It sounds like you're doing a good job. I'm glad to see that there is going to be some changes. It's always good to freshen whatever up. And I'm, Doc, you're on board with everything it sounds like here. Yes, indeed. And I, and I, I agree with you 100%. Some changes are always good. And, uh, and he's, he's, been, he's been recognizing that. And we, I think in this particular case, reaching out more, as he indicated, to the public and to the schools and to the local uh, scouts, etc. So try to get as much involvement with the community as possible. Yeah, I like that part of it too. We, we, I, mean, I, I do too. Good. We, 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 young lady here. What was your first name again? Taylor. Taylor. It's great that she has this opportunity. Thank you. Phil? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So there's a motion. We're going to come back to that issue. Yeah. Have, okay, thank you, sir. Um, Doc, thank you for your leadership uh, at the Hampton Chamber. I don't know how many years you've been there, just a couple. I, I think you're a recent graduate. <laughs> you're a recent graduate of winning, kind of like Taylor was going to be. Myself. So uh, <clears throat> um, uh, you're, you're, uh, you fly beneath the radar, but you're on the present, and uh, um, you've uh, provided great mentorship to the business community. Uh, you've been a fabulous business owner yourself in New Hampshire, thank and you uh, you've made a remarkable contribution, so thank you. And uh, John, that equally goes for you and uh, your energy level, and thank you for stepping in. Uh, with the chamber and, and doing the remarkable job that you do. Um, Taylor, uh, you, you epitomize the great people and, and uh, like the uh, ROTC program. Uh, we have an intern at being insurance that's turned into employees. Just a, a fabulous, fabulous asset in this community. And uh, kudos to, to you for bringing these young people in and uh, supplementing the effort. It's a great experience for them. Um, we'll get back to that traffic thing. But, John, uh, is the state, uh, I know you wear a bunch of different hats. You, you, you heard my comments about um, the website. Is the state um, uh, doing anything for you? It is a state park. Uh, they get nine points on every French fries sold down there. Uh, are they providing any marketing? We know Cannon Mountain gets $300,000 of marketing, um, essentially, uh, from the state. And, and it's essentially a good portion of that money is provided by Hampton. What have been your efforts to secure uh, additional advertising uh, and additional promotional uh, uh, exposure both in terms of real dollars and uh, on that web platform we'll be um, we'll be uh, working with uh, Phil Bryce um, along with their marketing team um, some of the things that we're going to uh, encourage them to do on their website is for example this PowerPoint presentation that's being uh, shared with the uh, uh, residents of Hampton uh, it's a great PowerPoint presentation uh, that's so that's one thing but we uh, We've agreed to recognize each other as partners, um, and uh, that it showed who are our negotiations with this year's uh, service agreement. Um, so in this meeting that we will be having, um, we plan to ask them to have active um, seafood festival um, bullet points information on their website. Um, and we're also going to ask them to have a link from theirs to ours um, on their front page um, so that we uh, we can say that, you know, coming into uh, the end of August and early September, uh, that when you click on the uh, Dread, Dread website, um, you'll see the Seafood Festival on the first page. Uh, thank you, because when, you know, all through the summer, it's been uh, Sunapee. Mm -hmm. And there's just uh, Mr. Chairman and board members. There's nothing about Hampton. And uh, again, Canon gets 300000 for for uh, um, marketing and advertising. And uh, I'm very direct in my approach, very dissatisfied with uh, how that, that operation's run. We've discussed this with the governor. Uh, and the delegation feels the same way. And I know in some instances, you know that there can be a better relationship. And if, if we can secure that support financially, and if we can secure that marketing support that both Sunapee gets, that other state parks get, and that uh, Canon gets $300,000 of cash in, uh, and I'd be interested in you keeping me as a member of that council and a, and a legislator um, uh, informed. And if you, you uh, need any help, I'm happy to provide some to you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so we have, a, we have a motion. We have a second? Yes, sir. Second. Uh, any other discussion on it? No? All in favor? And one abstention. 
Very good. Thank I, you very much. I have Oops. just one thing I wanted to ask John. Okay. Um, what it ha has anything <coughs> has, has anything going on about the, the possibility of putting the advertising on those signs? Have, <coughs> that was something that we talked about at the Hampton Area Commission. Mm -hmm. How has that gone along? The, the signs. You mean the the fences? Oh, okay. Going back to the fences for a minute. We, um, I, I just had a second conversation with the chief, and we have seven community organizations, not businesses. Um, um, I was at that same meeting that the chief was with the governor and uh, the commissioner of DOT, and she loves the idea. Um, so does Commissioner Rose of Dredd uh, and the governor. And so I've identified seven organizations here in town, the Mountain Patrol, uh, Experience Hampton, Chamber of Commerce, um, and we are now at the point of um, securing logos for all of those organizations. Um, I have found a, a vendor um, that will be able to do them. It's, I believe it's the same vendor that um, does them for some of the major cities like Nashville that has uh, fencing like this. Um, so unfortunately, we won't have them for this year. Uh, but a number of the organizations will be ordering them this year under their 2017 budgets uh, so that once we put the fencing up um, uh, next year, we'll have all the banners and experience Hampton. We'll have some um, and others. And the Beach Commission, since we do have a little bit of money in our, in our budget, uh, we're also going to be buying complimentary uh, blank, blue uh, blank banners, uh, if you will, or covering so that we can space out the different uh, organizations and, and kind of fill in uh, the, in the is beginning. Is it still seafood or are we in something else? Uh, you were, the question was... Oh, was it seafood? Yes, it was seafood. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Advertising. Nice knowing you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very nice nice guys. Thank you. Bye, guys. We dropped the age, uh, age average down. By yeah, yeah, yeah. By, <laughs> we <laughs> thought, it, we thought it might help. <laughs> Bye, Doc. Bye, John. All right, now if we can have DPW, please. Jen Hale and uh, Chris Jacobs. And we're going to be talking about bid and construction phase services for Lafayette Road Sewer. here before you for is uh, requesting the approval of Wright Pierce's proposal for the bidding and construction phase of the sewer project. We were here a few months back asking for the funding for the design of it. Uh, this sewer project is the sewer project that was approved by Warren article back in March. Um, the project has been put out to bid. Uh, we had our pre-bid meeting last week uh, we did have two vendors attend uh, it had been sent out and everything so we're waiting for the results to see what comes back in for that bid but this is the contract for those services that Wright Pierce provides uh, through the bidding process and through construction um, this includes on-site full-time oversight uh, we'll be back before you once we have a bid and all those good things um, to you know request night work uh, for when the sewer goes in with whatever contractor is chosen. But this um, proposal includes the time to have Wright Pierce, the engineer, over um, looking uh, the construction full time. Um, that helps us out, obviously, and uh, the town as a whole. So this proposal um, or recommendation is uh, we are recommending that the board approve and authorize the town manager to execute the proposal provided by Wright Pierce in the amount of $53,560 for bidding construction phase services. Uh, this is under their general engineering agreement that's already been negotiated with the town. Uh, and this is for the following reasons. The town has utilized the professional engineering design and construction services of Wright Pierce for multiple sewer projects over the last four years. They have worked with the town to complete the installation uh, including the sludge to watering press, the design and permitting of the Church Street pump station, the design and permitting that we did for the Church Street force main, and the ongoing facility study, to name a few. Uh, Wright Pierce is also the engineer of record who has designed the sewer project, so they are intimately aware of what uh, will be put in the ground. Um, 
when we started the Church Street Pump Station project, we did do an RFQ, uh, and th we interviewed three different firms. Right, Pierce was the selected firm as a result of that RFQ process. Uh, right, Pierce would start immediately. Obviously, we're in the midst of the bid process. Um, they have already prepared the design drawings I've mentioned. They also have been um, ongoing coordinating with Aquarian. Uh, to make sure that all new water line and sewer lines do not have conflict. Uh, they have also uh, been working with us in monitoring all the field conditions that Aquarian has encountered from being out in the middle of uh, Lafayette Road. So this recommendation to award uh, the proposal complies with the Town of Hampton purchasing policy, referencing section 718-4 subsection B because the engineer was previously selected under an open process for engineering services within the last three years. So this 53000 is going to just come from budget? This is coming from the Warren article that from was approved article. in March for the Lafayette Road sewer project. So these are part of the expenditures we knew we would have when we put out the total cost for the Warren article. But has that been bonded yet? because until we have a bill and, and we need to okay all right work, then we need an actual bid to bond yeah right. that's exactly okay. right. all right right all right so okay and, and this work was was anticipated and was included in the original estimate of the overall appropriation okay all right it's not like gotcha. an afterthought all right thank you and they've been able to get the bid out to 10 contractors were definitely were directly contract contacted to make sure that they were interested in going forward with this job and four have actually picked up plans and specifications which normally is a couple hundred dollar commitment on their behalf to actually uh, submit a bid so we're expecting four bids okay rusty no i think they're following the procedure and we've used them in the past i, I get no problem with it mr bean uh yeah $53,560 that complies with our purchasing policy, reviewed by the town manager, submitted by you folks, that goes to pay for the engine, and my, I've lost this, disappeared. Right. Work. The bid and construction phase. Bid and construction phase. Uh, I've reviewed all the source documents. Pending Mr. Griffin's uh, comments, I move that we authorize them. Rick? Yeah, I have no problem. I'll second, unless you want to. Motion by Phil, seconded by Rusty. All in favor? Unanimous. You're all set there. And you have other things for us too, right? Yes, I do. This goes back to what we were talking about earlier regarding the paving okay. and the award of contract to of the town's paving bid. Uh, the paving bid was put out um, and bids received um, from, I believe it was... Uh, yeah. four different vendors uh, so we put out the bid in such a form uh, that we do it in parts part a is the roads that we would like to do depending on how much dollars it comes in as can we do it all and then part b what's it going to cost the town to buy asphalt if we do our own work and then part c through i are unit prices for any additional work that's not specifically described in part a What's it going to cost to put pavement down, to fill joints, to grind work, to raise structures, those type of things. So the bid went out. The bid came back in. Um, it went out to uh, 10 different vendors according to the purchasing policy. We received four bids, tabulated the bids, and Brock Industries uh, was the lowest bidder. And the way we look at that is that part A. If we were to do all the roads that we wanted to, what did Brock tell us and what did the other vendors tell us that the price would be? Um, and that came in um, $680,188. I tell you that value because the recommendation uh, that is before you is for less than that. Um, as I mentioned, we put out all the roads we'd like to do. But once we look at our budget and what's already been expended through this, um, through that Warren article thing, but we, didn't have, we didn't have $680,000 left. So our recommendation is to award uh, the paving bid to Brock's uh, 
We recommend that the Board of Selectmen accept the bid for parts A through I submitted by Brock Industries and authorize the town manager to enter into an initial contract in the amount of $500,000. This amount represents the work with, uh, associated with Part A as bid that has been reduced to fit within the budget available uh, for the 2017 Warren Article Number 19 that was passed. The I'll make that motion. Okay. Second. Made by Rick, seconded by Phil. Uh, discussion? Rusty? Uh, I just think, uh, you know, CPI, is it CPI that did it last year? CPI? GMI. GMI did an, uh, a great job. Uh, but, you know, if you notice who's working out on the state road out here, it's Brock. Yeah. And so they're already in the area, so I'm sure that's come on, on the bid. And, and Brock does excellent work, too. And this is not representative of the work that GMI has done. This was excellent. the bid process that we put forth per the purchasing policy, and this is what happens sometimes. Absolutely. You know, and to, to finish with that thought, a couple of times, and I forget who on the board have asked, why do we keep continually only get one or two bidders? Why do we? Why don't we get more bidders? This the, here's the answer. Last year's bid was for amount less than let's say a half a million dollars. It was only several hundred thousand dollars worth of work. When we combined the state's money that we get in the block grant, the, the 306, married it with another 300, and and request 600 some odd thousand dollars worth of work, the bigger firms who have a sharper pencil can step out of the woodwork and submit bids for this kind of work because it's worth their time and effort. So um, it wasn't before that we were doing something wrong. It's just we didn't have the big enough piece of apple pie to offer up. And here's the answer, and that's how you get four good competitive bids. So. Good. Okay. Well, we have a bid. We have a bid. We have a motion. <laughs> we have a second. All in favor? Opposed? None? Even unanimous. Anything else? Anything else? Nothing I had, but I was. I, got, I would ask a question. To prepared to answer questions. Yeah. Um, High Street. Uh, schedule is to pave Wednesday, weather permitting. Okay, what? Pave Wednesday, weather permitting. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, my understanding is it's only going to rain overnight, and it's going to end tomorrow at seven. So, in, in this area, um, that would allow GMI to go get done whatever other work they need to get done on Tuesday to then do our work on Wednesday. Okay. Good. So. Regina? I'm good. Don't anticipate it. Nope. It's been a good summer so far. No. Oh, question. sorry. <laughs> the, uh, you have a truck that's uh, broke down or 82? <laughs> yes, 82 is the, um, that was in your, uh, or it's in the manager's report, is our oldest sludge roll-off truck. Um, we were offered, I think, $20,000 for it last year. This year, in Every year in September, we reinspect all our vehicles. The frame's gone in it, and some other things. Twenty-one thousand dollars to repair the truck. I elected that it was now not worth putting twenty thousand into a twenty thousand dollar truck. Um, we'll let it go in the next auction. See what somebody will give us. We'll let somebody else put some money into it. I mean, it's it's got reasonable miles on the on the engine and the, and the chassis, but it's just you know. Part of it is that it hauls something that is corrosive, i.e. sludge, uh, parked next to the sludge building, i.e. backs into the landfill, I'm sure, on other sludge. It just, trucks like that don't last, but it has reached its, what I would consider, re reasonable uh, limit for repair in continuing on the town profit. Thank you. I did find out today at Academy Ave, trees, uh, the three that, three of the Five trees that we recommended are, I guess, the limbs and the tops were taken off. The crane is going to come maybe Wednesday uh, to take the rest of those trees down. The very thin pine trees. And, very I, thin. and I did have a phone call not thanking us for doing that. Okay. I, I don't know if it's a mistake or not, but you don't spell bees, B E E apostrophe S. Correct. Somebody spelt it that way. Did I? <laughs> Could be the engineering major did that. And not the English <laughs> <laughs> well, we went to that deputy dog school there. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> really bad. Rick, you have any questions? No, thank you. Phil? Uh, yeah, end of hostilities on Route 1, uh, just for the business owners, when that you think that will be done and paved, your current operations? 
current operations, water is scheduled to be the end of August. End of August, no one But then we get right in there. With a, we're coming back to you at the next meeting for a, pay, a pay, uh, sewer replacement award, and that'll be take all of September and October. October, so. so. Our end date with the sewer contract is November 15th. So November 15th, you yeah. think you'll have a road back? Yeah. Okay. Just people asking. We're, we're already having discussions with them. They want to leave a temporary patch so that it yeah. is aware. Yep. Read your no. stuff. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Uh, oh, town manager's report. Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Work on the removal of the railroad abutment and uh, rebuilding Drake Side Road is progressing. As anticipated, the roadway will remain closed until August 18th due to all the granite blocks that were in need of removal. And I understand as they were removing them, they found two additional rows of blocks behind the front row of blocks. So it took quite a bit of effort to get all those out of there. And they were tied together, uh, the blocks that ran into the hill, and they were all pinned together. So it took quite a bit of effort to get them pulled apart. Public Works uh, Unit 82, which you just heard about. Um, we have a second vehicle for hauling sludge for that purpose, so we're not in dire need of a replacement for this. If uh, the second unit, uh, which I think is Unit 83, should have to be down for any reason, we can also contact uh, Waste Management to do hauling for that particular purpose if we need it, so we have some versatility. The State Department of Natural and Cultural Resources has responded to our letter. This is the old Dread Department. Uh, on ambulance calls, indicating that they, we will receive a communication in anticipation of having a response by the end of the month of August from, uh, from the department. Um, bids for the replacement of the Lafayette Road sewer main are due for opening August 18th with work scheduled to begin, begin after the Seafood Festival if the bid prices are accepted and within the appropriation approved by town meeting. Uh, we, as I said, we did receive a response to the letter on ambulance cost at the beach. Uh, we also received a letter from the Department of Environmental Services, which I believe I've handed a copy out to everyone, Ron. Uh, this is dealing with a preliminary large well Citing a large groundwater withdrawal permit application for acquiring a water company, well number 22, which is uh, just off of uh, Woodland Road uh, and River, Little River Road. Uh, the Department of Environmental Services has turned down the application. Uh, they have stated three and a half pages worth of uh, uh, things that need to be fixed and, and, and reported. Uh, to the state in order to bring the application up for further consideration. So that's not moving forward at this point. Um, we did send a letter to uh, Aquarion uh, dealing with hydrants, escrow, and, 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 and uh, uh, their work on hydrants. We withheld some money uh, pending explanation from Aquarion with regards to why a, a large number of fire hydrants were not maintained during the previous year. So if, if we've indicated to them if they can uh, fulfill the need for explanation about what, what was going on there, that we'd be happy to pay the remainder of the bill. But we do need some answers on that. Uh, as we were talking to uh, folks on the uh, west side streets off of uh, Ashworth Avenue and, and Brown Avenue, uh, a discussion came up about the, the new tax relief program for uh, coastal properties subject to storm surge, sea level rise, and extreme participation, uh, precipitation. <clears throat> i got to get that word all right. <laughs> they are participating, but it's pre precipitation. Um, as you know, the town had accepted the provisions of RSA 70, uh, 79E, which deals with giving tax credits to properties. Uh, this is now a purpose for which tax credits can be given by the selectmen under that statute. Uh, if they decide to rehabilitate their individual homes, raise them, uh, they can get a tax credit for that, uh, for that cost. So it's something to, to take into consideration and thought in your mind. Um, I think people, people down at the beach know about it, and I think we'll probably be receiving some applications as work progresses to uh, avoid the current problems down there with flooding that's affecting some of the properties of the beach. And that's it, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Questions? Um, 
Yeah, town manager. Also, we talked at that meeting with the beach people about perhaps uh, making an amendment to municipal parking regulations. Yes, and I believe the board has a copy of that. Yes. Um, for people to, when in these floody conditions, they could perhaps go to certain town designated areas. Any, any town parking lot. Any town parking any lot. Any town, town owned parking lot. I'd like to make that motion that that happen according to the letter that you've submitted. I'll second it. Sure. Okay, any discussion on that? All in favor? Unanimous? It's done. Good. I also uh, have begun research with uh, our IT department on setting up an automatic response for uh, flood tides or tides tides above 10 feet okay. and, and for severe storm surges. And uh, we're going to try to put something together on that on a voluntary program. Mm -hmm. So that we should, it'll get automatic notices out to people in these affected areas so they'll know something's coming give them advance warning to get their vehicles out of there so they won't be destroyed. Yes, definitely. Okay. Rusty? Nope. I'm sorry. So you're saying that uh, these tax credits is the way to go around this rather than a um, abatement? I'm not saying that. There are, there are obviously several different means that they can use to do that, and, and one of them may be FEMA funds don't know that yet. Depends upon what FEMA decides on individual parcels of property and the number of claims on properties that are submitted in the town because of the sea level rise that we're going through. And the uh, the uh, I noticed uh, in the last week there have been two days. I think everybody knows where Gun Rock is down at the uh, the beach uh, right next to the low tide jetty. Uh, usually, uh, until the last few weeks, I've never seen the rock completely exposed and probably 20 feet, feet of sand around the rock completely exposed with no water at all at low tide. That means it's going to be a much higher tide coming along afterwards uh, to, to compensate for that change. Uh, there are things that are changing dynamically down the beach, and FEMA funds may be available for that. It's going to take applications and time to sort through that to see if we can't help people get those. The uh, Using uh, credits or tax credits may be one of the vehicles the board chooses as they review the entire portfolio of what can happen, and abatements may be another means. So are the tax credits available today? They are, because you have accepted RSA 79E. Mm -hmm. So if there was an application made to the board, you may consider it, and you may do something with it if the board so desires. So that's immediate. So each one would be dealt with in a, on an individual basis? It would be, yes. The only exception to that might be, uh, as you, you might remember, a number of years ago, uh, the folks who live along uh, our shoreline with the river on the west, on the south side, uh, in Sun Valley, uh, wanted to replace all those seawalls that are over there that are private. They were privately owned and privately built. And they came in, they hired an engineering firm, and they came in and filed a massive joint application for all of those. So that could be done here. And you could be considering something on a massive basis where the, the leverage for the individual or group of properties can be used to help get the work done. And that's something that they're going to have to plan out, and we've mentioned that to them so that they have some ability to, to, to utilize and they something. I think it will be more beneficial if they do it together because they all have the same problems. And right now it's a major right. health issue down there. Yep. Major health and safety issue. Like there was something that happened down one of those streets, there was no way a fire truck could get down there, four feet of water. That's true. It's just um, not going to happen. So they are working on writing a letter to all our state and U.S. representatives, yep. and I think they've actually gotten together with over the high street. Uh, yeah. That was the Connected intention. Connected then with Tom, Tom over on high street, and he was uh, <coughs> very responsive to that, too. So Yeah, they're, they're trying, the two areas of town that are affected are trying to work together to get something done because they realize that their, um, shall I say, their political clout on the federal level is much larger with a larger group. So they're working hard to try to get something done over there in both areas. I think that's very good. We should continue to aid them and assist them. 
we should continue to uh, to help sponsor these things before the federal government, the state government, and make sure they're heard. Because as an individual, they may not be heard because one voice amongst many sometimes doesn't uh, gather a lot of you know momentum in these things. So they're going to form, I think, an organization that will bring that momentum forward to help them achieve the goals they need to achieve to, to address the flooding and save their homes. Good. Thank you. Phil? Pleasure. Yeah, uh, I'd like a chop on legal and the applicability of 79E as it's been uh, introduced in the 2017 session. Yeah. Uh, we formally uh, have adopted it uh, under uh, much more limited and restricted uh, uh, provisions. Uh, when it was used in one instance during my tenure on this board, it went to luxury condominiums that sold at over uh, between three and four hundred dollars a square foot. Real estate values are appraising uh, and, uh, or, and uh, increasing at phenomenal records here. Uh, the assessments have just gone out. The values are up. Um, so uh, again, uh, 79E. The last time I went through here gave $175,000 to people that bought luxury condominiums at Hampton Beach. Uh, I have lived in uh, a state where uh, tornadoes or hurricane warnings and hurricanes and the ocean surges uh, are, are magnificent and homes are destructed and they're rebuilt. Uh, the National Flood uh, uh, Insurance Program uh, is $25 billion in the red. Let me say that again. $25 billion in the red. So that means it's not insurance, it's a government subsidy uh, to those that, um, uh, in the case of the sea spray, buy, uh, and we're all for people buying luxury homes. Uh, it's a, uh, if they secure coverage, um, they, they do so because the United States of America runs a program that they call insurance that uh, any uh, insurance commissioner in the country would shut down. Um, based on the fact that it's insolvent. Uh, so I, I have severe uh, um, uh, concerns about providing tax relief to properties uh, in one section of the town uh, at the expense of uh, other citizens and taxpayers in the town um, that could incur damage to their home uh, from any number of things. Uh, but they remain uh, unaided. They remain without financial support. They do not receive federal subsidies, and uh, they are not uh, able to uh, claim benefit as those in luxury condominiums that the sea spread did. And when we gave away that $175,000, that means the rest of us pay uh, for it. have to pay for it. Right. Say that again, Mr. Walsh. The rest of the people in town paid for that money. Exactly. And uh, I've yeah, been plus down, interest. Exactly. I've been down to Jensen. And uh, I've been to Green, and again, I've lived in those communities where homes are swept away and they're rebuilt. And uh, yeah. some of them are luxury and some of them aren't. And, and, and a lot of people, they've received their homes and ownership down through the generations, and we're sympathetic to that. Uh, if there's an issue with the valuation of a home that's destroyed, um, then that is something between the assessor, in my opinion. And uh, if the property is destroyed, there is insurance for flood insurance. There is insurance through uh, a homeowners. There is insurance through a commercial property. But uh, when we get into 79A, and I'm on the record, and I'm putting legislation that didn't make it out of the committee, uh, we're asking some taxpayers to subsidize others. Yeah. And in the case of the sea spray, uh, it's 400 bucks a square foot. Just wanted that on the record. Thank you. So you're against the doing this? I'm, I'm saying uh, I have severe concerns. We have adopted the 79E that was formally enacted. This uh, bill that we have handed out on our packet, Senate Bill 185, that is here, and, and Mark's the lawyer. I haven't had time to uh, chop it, and, and I do want a legal chop. It's effective not yet, but September 3rd, 2017. Right. It is a different bill. It has different wording, and it, uh, as such, um, needs a, a legal job uh, from our town and school. Um, but I, I think my comments are pretty clear, and I don't think they're very ambivalent. Okay. Anybody else for the town? No, for the town manager? Nothing? Okay. Uh, we don't need to vote on anything that you've just talked about. No, sir. So, there. so we move on to old business. I'd like to make a motion. Okay. What would your motion be? To uh, give the town manager and the assistant town manager a rate increase of 1.65%. I'll second that. All right. 
I'll second that. Yeah. And do we have any discussion on that, or anybody wishing to speak? Okay. Uh, all in favor? I would just like to say it's the same as all of the other employees. Same as all the other employees. Okay. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, new business. We have the fire lane designation south side of Dustin Avenue. Mr. Chairman, uh, the fire chief has requested this uh, fire lane. Well, he has the right to designate it himself, but he's he's asking the board if they agree with him uh, on designating uh, that fire lane. You'll see that he's included some pictures uh, with his memorandum of people who are parking on that side. They had a fire call down there about a week ago and the fire engine had great difficulty coming around the corner because of the number of people parked on the south side of the road and where they were parked. Uh, which And that road is, allows parking now on the south side the entire length. So they're concerned that uh, depending on where they park, and you can see from this photograph of this particular car that was parked there, the one that was almost hit, uh, is short of the stop line and actually blocks that side of the roadway. So they requested that the fire chief has requested that that be made into a fire lane, parking allowed on the other side of the street, the north side of the street. So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Rusty, mm -hmm. seconded by Regina. Uh, any discussion on this? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Bowden. No. <laughs> okay. All in favor? All right. Next would be the appointments to Seacoast Cancer Cluster Investigation Commission. If I may, Mr. Chairman, yep. uh, uh, as someone that sits on that committee, per my uh, previous remarks, uh, Representative Cushing is seeking that post as a uh, member to be appointed uh, uh, as a Hampton representative. He sent uh, uh, as a Hampton citizen. Uh, he uh, sent an email to the board uh, this afternoon at 1445. It reads, uh, if I may, sir, dear members of the Hampton Select Board, early last year the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services determined there was a double pediatric cancer cluster in the Seacoast. In response to the, that determination, Governor Hassan established a task force to investigate the cluster. I was appointed to serve as a member of the task force and over the past 15 months have participated in numerous meetings and work sessions in investigating the cancer cluster and its impact upon the health and safety of the Seacoast. Recently, the legislature passed and the governor signed into law HB 484, which establishes a commission to build upon and continue the work of the task force. HB 484 provides that the town of Hampton have a representative on the newly created commission. Attached is the copy. As you know, the Speaker of the House is appointed Phil Bean, blah, blah, blah. I am interested in continuing to be part of the work surrounding the cancer cluster and respectfully submit my name to you and ask for your consideration as an appointee of the town of Hampton to HB 484. I'll, and that's from me. I'll make that motion that um, he be appointed. The Representative Cushing be, yes. be appointed. I'll second that. Okay. Representative Cushing does a lot for this town and will continue sure on the show to an excellent job. He really job. does. And, and, yeah, and, and if I just may, uh, Representative Messner um, is the, the real uh, driving force behind absolutely. this, and she'll be working with uh, our Eversource and our further discussions, uh, Mr. Griffin. So she, she, she is super, and uh, Rainey is, of course, incredible. Thank you. All in favor? Unanimous. All right, number four, we already, the chief spoke to us about the uh, yeah. steel barriers. Uh, number five, intervention in PUC Aquarian acquisition proceedings, and I believe the town council is here to speak on that. Oh, number three. Oh, I'm sorry, number three, 2020 census, local update of census addresses operation LUCA. Mr. Chairman, this is uh, something that we, uh, we had at the last census, uh, we did not participate simply because of the amount of workload that's required in this. Uh, and the census went off very well. Uh, I don't see the need for the town to be doing all that work. It's going to put a lot of burden on, on various employees in the town in order to complete this. Uh, they do ask us questions and get things straightened out that we work closely with them. But I don't think we need to set a formal program on this. Okay. I have no motion, and then we don't motion, do it. Right, we'll do it. Okay, pass it over and over. All right, intervention in PUC Aquarian acquisition proceedings. Yes, um, attorney. Yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, June 29, 2017, 
a joint petition for approval of an acquisition of Aquarian Water Company of New Hampshire, Inc. by Eversource Energy was filed with our Public Utilities Commission. Yes. And uh, there will be uh, simultaneously similar proceedings in the states of Massachusetts and Connecticut because Eversource Energy, a Massachusetts company, and electric, an electric utility, is seeking to acquire the assets indirectly of the other affiliates of Aquarian Water Company of New Hampshire, Inc., namely its affiliates in Massachusetts and Connecticut, uh, formerly owned by um, uh, the Macquarie Utilities and uh, an uh, Australian bank. Um, we have received a notice from the uh, utilities as ordered by the Public Utilities Commission indicating that by August 15th, uh, any party that wishes to intervene in these matters needs to file a motion to intervene, a petition to intervene, and then there will be a pre-hearing conference on August 17th at 1.30 p.m. at the Public Utilities Commission at which each party will provide a preliminary statement of its position with regard to the petition and any of the issues involved. And further, immediately following that pre-hearing conference, the Aquarian Eversource, the staff of the Commission, and any interveners will hold a technical session to review the petition. Um, I think it's important uh, that this, the town has uh, the prior boards of selectmen from 2008 on have um, authorized my office to file petitions to intervene in every single rate proceeding that's involved Aquarian and every single um, matter in which Aquarian has sought to change its operations, such as the monthly billing petition that came up last year. Uh, we have approximately three-quarters of all the residential customers of Aquarian. Uh, we utilize more than half of the public fire hydrants for which Aquarian ensures the availability of water. And uh, it is, it is critical, we have critical interests in the operation of this particular utility. Um, and so I believe it, it, it's imperative that not only do we file a petition to intervene, but also that we set forth in that petition <clears throat> the various concerns that, from our experience with this utility, are things that should be taken into account when there's ever a change in ownership to Eversource or anybody else. Um, and I think it's imperative that I'm setting forth those interests and concerns that that basically um, energize the Commission staff as well as the Commission and also the Office of Consumer Advocate to engage in those same concerns. Um, and I'm prepared, I can outline the ones that I have provided the Board with a draft petition. And just to highlight these, we should ask, what are Eversource's plans for Aquarian's next general rate petition? Will Eversource be seeking an increase in the percentage return on equity and thus in the allowed rate of return in the next rate case? Will Aquarian under the ownership of Eversource effectively seek to penalize customers for conserving water and thus lowering revenues in the next general rate case as occurred in the last 2012 general rate case? Will Aquarian under the ownership of Eversource be willing to seek the Commission's permission to restructure rates so as to charge higher water usage customers a different per gallon rate than regular residential customers using such tools in, as inclining block rates? How will Eversource improve the monitoring and remediation of pollution in Aquarian wells by PFCs? What will Eversource's approach be to better meet Aquarian's obligations to maintain fire hydrants? What are Eversource's plans to ensure public safety when implementing the large groundwater withdrawal at Well 22 in Hampton, for which Aquarian is currently seeking authorization from the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, DES? What are Eversource's plans for Aquarian water tank maintenance and replacement? 
Will Eversource seek to expand Aquarian's territory to include towns such as Stratum? Will Aquarian, under Eversource's ownership, continue the practice of not paying on the principle of long-term debts, thereby devaluing the company's equity? Does Eversource have the managerial ability to operate a public utility of this kind? Does Eversource have the technical ability to operate a public utility of this kind? Is Eversource's proposed acquisition of Aquarian for the public good and in the public interest? And under each of these categories, I've outlined some details based on our experience that inform why we are asking these particular questions. I don't know how much Aquarian and ever uh, I don't know how much Eversource, which is an electric utility, has gotten into any of these issues. But they're certainly uh, they need to go into this with their eyes open, and and know that we have these concerns. Questions? Well, I'd be willing to bet that Eversource doesn't have an idea of current Aquarian uh, functioning or managing whatever you want to call it right now. And then as far as like wells, like well 22, and I know there's been a lot of concerns with our well 7 because it's just not, the radius is not big enough. I'm not sure, I mean, they're new. If we should maybe mention these things to them, this is their first water venture. Um, they're taking river rising into consideration, not just <coughs> sea level rising, but along with the sea, the river's going to rise. And then could they maybe accommodate more for specific geographic locations when um, implementing new wells? I'm not sure if any of that should be added, but I definitely think that after, you said next week is the? The uh, deadline for filing this, this uh, particular petition is uh, August 15th. Uh, but nevertheless, I think the sooner we file it, the better, because then it will um, inform all of the people involved as to... Including Eversource? Including Eversource, absolutely. Okay. And um, I know Representative Mesmer requested to have a public hearing on this acquisition, and she also asked if maybe the town of Hampton could host it to include um, representatives from, obviously, her Rye, our representatives, Northampton Water Commissioner Selectman, same thing in my Water Commissioner Selectman. And uh, Carl, Operations Manager of Aquarian, should be mandatory that he's there. And also maybe DES, Department of Environmental Services, attend. Um, pos if it would be possible to have some type of a regular Board of Selectmen meeting with some of these individuals here so that we could sort of come up with like a game plan. This is what we want to try to get accomplished in the public hearing. but. I think all this information that we've recently been f finding out about Aquarian, um, Tom's comments seem to fall pretty much in line with DES's comments. I think you're gonna, you said he was going to be looking at them just to make sure yes. he was going to look at them again. Yes. But this is stuff, they're new to water, and they've never done this before, and they're going to be entering into this type of situation I think we uh, deserve to all let them know what the deal is and what's going on. Make sure they know all our concerns. Rusty? Ditto. <laughs> uh, Rick? <laughs> Phil? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Esquire, thanks for all your work uh, and yes, you know, all the different issues, the myriad issues you uh, demonstrate your expertise in. Uh, reading the New Hampshire DES uh, uh, well 22 correspondence of 3 August uh, 2017. Uh, does that come in uh, for any consideration, the denial of, uh, of that under myriad uh, um, reasonings? Um, yes. Is, is that incorporated into your response? It will be. Okay. And uh, so that's more documentation than it will be. Can you explain that for the public, uh, what's going on with that? And I have the letter here if you need it. Sure. Thank you. Yes, uh, there was a uh, public hearing held on the large groundwater withdrawal proposal regarding so-called Well 22. This is a well that was already dug in the year 2012 but has never been implemented. Um, before, this is a deep uh, bedrock well. It's over 500 feet down. Um, 
there are uh, being in bedrock this well has the ability to influence many different uh, aspects of water uh, from uh, rivers and actually the ocean it could it could involve uh, salt water intrusion it could involve arsenic it could affect neighboring wells which are more shallow including well seven uh, that was mentioned uh, it could potentially dewater uh, various bodies of water depending on its cone of influence and the tests that are proposed to identify all those and at what pumping rate is safe to operate this well is the so-called uh, uh, large water groundwater withdrawal tests that pumping tests that uh, the utility and its uh, engineering contractor proposed to do in August and so a public hearing was held on their side of the equation on June 5th and thereafter uh, from 45 days the record was open for comments to be made. The towns of Hampton and Northampton together uh, hired Professor Thomas Ballestero, a well-respected expert from the University of New Hampshire, to provide comments on the proposal and he identified a multi-page uh, submission uh, filed on time to explain uh, the concerns with the various uh, effects this well could have and what protective measures needed to be implemented before the pumping test was even held, as well as additional monitoring techniques that he suggested in order to properly assess the effects of this well. Of this well. And, uh, DES issued uh, this uh, document dated August 3, 2017 uh, that uh, adopted many of uh, Professor Ballesteros' comments and indicated that it cannot approve the preliminary application at this time and identified a number of reasons uh, that it, uh, it asked for additional responses to certain comments, a number of which came from Dr. Ballestero. Uh, so we're in the process right now of comparing side by each the comments, the responses by DES to Professor Ballestero's comments to make sure that we've covered the ground sufficiently uh, so that uh, we're, we're um, maximizing our effectiveness in, in, uh, in making sure this well is, is uh, safely implemented or in fact not implemented at all. So, uh, I've, got, I've got more of yeah. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we uh, have all been in receipt and copied uh, from Bob Landman. You can uh, um, uh, present uh, his interest in this. There was a uh, 3 August letter that they are essentially, for us laymen, uh, uh, escrowing, uh, in essence, um, for the bill of $131,000 for maintenance and flushing of fire hydrants. I'd like a dialogue, an explanation of this issue uh, from Northampton uh, for the public and engage in a dialogue uh, with Mr. Welch for the public's uh, benefit on what we're doing to, to mimic that effort. Is it substantial? And if I may say so, in just a, a brief synopsis, is that um, the water company, Aquarion, is billing the town of Northampton, and, and Mark will, will uh, explain it, for services uh, that they haven't performed habitually, habitually have not performed these services, and they are escrowing the funds. There is uh, correspondence here on 8-3 from Mr. Landman uh, to Mr. Welch, and if you could explain that and engage in a dialogue with Mr. Welch on what our records are similar to that. Sure. And if we would be putting that, that type of uh, lien, if you will, on the sale process uh, with the PUC. Thank Here, you. Uh, the town of Hampton on a twice a year basis as are uh, towns of uh, Northampton and the Rye Water District receives a bill for hydrants. Uh, this bill is not based on uh, volume of water used, rather it's for the availability of water uh, to the system for firefighting purposes. Uh, now that availability not, depends not only on the uh, having a proper water pressure up at the water tank in, uh, that's on Exeter Road that's being uh, yeah. at one time proposed to be uh, taken down and maintained, but it also depends on each individual hydrant 
uh, being properly maintained and being identified as to its supply capability so that firefighters can, can know what to hook up to. And, and uh, so there, that's two critical components. Uh, we are billed the sum of approximately $1,800 per hydrant on an annual basis. And that, uh, that involves approximately, I think it's $460,000. That's a very substantial sum for this town. And as I say, we have over half of the hydrants in this system. Um, back in the year 2008, uh, as part of the rate case at that time, uh, the town of Northampton in particular uh, focused on the issue of hydrant maintenance and uh, developed a, a settlement agreement with uh, the uh, water company uh, regarding certain things based on an engineering study that it was supposed to do with regard to hydrants. And uh, it is uh, believed that th these obligations have not been met entirely. That may be the uh, an understatement. But in any event, uh, Mr. Welch has sent out a letter uh, to Aquarian outlining <coughs> where, uh, where it is believed that these uh, steps that were supposed to be taken have not been taken and as uh, suggesting that we are going to withhold part of the, the bill that's the semi-annual bill that's coming up to reflect a proration as to those hydrants that have not been maintained. Did I, uh, what else would you like to add? We, uh, we did do an analysis of the entire uh, report that they filed with the Public Utilities Commission on hydrants, and there were over 200 hydrants that were not serviced, which is a problem. They were not listed on the report at all, so there was no service done whatsoever for those hydrants. Uh, we found a number of hydrants that had to be pumped because apparently the, either the drain is broken or the drain doesn't exist in those hydrants. So they had to be pumped as much as two times during the course of the year before they could be winterized. That's a problem because those hydrants can freeze with the water in it over the winter time. Well, sometimes the, the, the drain at the bottom of the hydrant is Plugged. in the water. Yeah. So it can't. So the, the, they have to make sure they either drain them or fill them with antifreeze so right. they won't freeze. That's right. Uh, we also found that uh, uh, with hydrants not being maintained, there's a requirement in the PUC regulations that hydrants must be flushed every year. And they, are not, they did not apply to the Public Utilities Commission for a waiver during the drought. They are required by law to flush the hydrants every year. It looks as if something in the order of 12 hydrants in their entire system were flushed. That's it. The purpose for flushing the hydrants is not to make sure the hydrant works properly, but to flush the individual lines between hydrants to clean them out so there's no accumulation of debris and other material in there that could damage firefighting operations as they're ongoing. That just is not being done. And there are a number of other issues. They found um, they had listed on their report, I think it was something like 24 hydrants that were damaged, and they didn't fix them all. I'm assuming they carried the damage report forward to the following year and fixed them the following year, but that's an assumption because we don't know that's been done. There's a lot of work that goes into a, a water system. Hydrant flushing is one of them. It's not being done properly under the PUC regulations. We did send our letter. I did receive an email response back from the, the managing officer who said their system conforms in every way to the Public Utilities Commission's regulations. If that's true, then the report they filed, the Form uh, EC15, I think it is, with the Public Utilities Commission is incorrect, substantially incorrect. So you can't have it both ways. It's either right or it's wrong. Uh, I know I talked to the officials in Northampton. They have the same problems, only worse. There is a requirement of PC, PUC regulations that uh, as you look at the hydrants, they're color-coded so that when the fire department shows up, they know how much water, on a, as a general rule, they can withdraw under pressure from the hydrant system. They have refused to comply with that order that was specifically given to them by the PUC by saying, oh, we know nothing about it. I had to provide them with a copy of the order. 
and they still have not painted the hydrants correctly. So there's a lot of things going on. May I, Mr. Chairman, because I've, I've got a series of questions. Yeah, this, is, this is not only a life safety issue. I think Northampton has taken the appropriate uh, uh, action on this. And if I may read the letter uh, that was sent from Northampton, and if we could follow their lead, and there'll be a motion or perhaps just a, an order to do so. Uh, it's to Carl uh, uh, McMorrin. And it is from the town of Northampton, the town administrator. I have your invoice in the amount of $131,000 and change for hydrant service in Northampton. I have reviewed the maintenance records, as Mr. Welch has just reviewed, regarding the maintenance um, of uh, the uh, hydrants. And uh, I have directed the finance uh, director to send in $7,377. And they're withholding because these services have not been performed. Now, we have water rate payers and taxpayers, and, and uh, Mr. Welch can explain this. Um, but um, Northampton has taken uh, what they feel is an unjust charge for services that have not been performed. Not only is it to violate uh, life safety protections, and there will be further documentation in this letter that they actually tested when temperatures were zero and maintained they flushed when temperatures were zero. And I know the board's read this. Also I have. painted. Um, and so uh, we have... Uh, more customers uh, than Northampton. Okay, uh, the charge is almost two thousand dollars per hydrant, and I would move uh, that uh, we follow a similar pattern. And, we already have. And, and have we escrowed the money? We have. Well, we just have not paid it. Okay, uh, I, I would move that we uh, we join in this effort and double down, uh, uh, escrow that money. Uh, and uh, send the letter, pay pay what Northampton deems appropriate if it, if it meets with the town esquires, uh, and put that in escrow and, and double uh, the effort with Northampton. That is a motion. Second. Okay, motion uh, by Phil, seconded by Rusty. If we don't have any discussion, can we have a vote? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you've you. already done it anyways, right? We, we, have, we have paid, we prorated the bill. Okay. Uh, both the January bill and the July bill, we have prorated both of them and taken it off the July bill. Okay. okay. And have we written a letter to them also? Yes, we have. Okay. okay. And, and our, our, our specific motion is to escrow. follow that to escrow, to escrow yeah. and send right. that letter. Yeah. Um, so Rye does nothing. Don't know what Rye is doing. Uh, that we've not heard from them in this matter. Okay. I heard that they have. They're having difficulty finding people to even run for select them there, so there's no one paying attention. They're actively trying to solicit some new blood. Okay, and going on, I've got uh, some more questions, please, uh, Mr. Chairman. Has uh, Eversource ever run anything uh, larger than perhaps a fish tank at their corporate offices in terms of uh, a water uh, um, supply? I understand this is their first foray into water okay, so, utilities. Uh, it would be uh, very similar to the Bean Insurance Agency uh, or uh, Central Care um, purchasing um, from Macquarie the assets and running it and saying we're going to keep the people. At that. It's, uh, th th it has the word utility in it, but it's, uh, it's an entirely different cat. Okay, got it. Uh, Going forward in this, this, this gets very technical, and there's the legal implication. Tom Bellistower, explain his role, uh, what it has been so far, and if you think there's a need uh, to expand his role to assist the town of Hampton, uh, both in ongoing pollution efforts uh, that uh, they've just set up the task force with, number one. Number two is we specifically address this issue, which is the purchase, and number three is uh, the uh, water quality issue. Yes, um, Mr. Ballestero has uh, extensive expertise in, in handling of stormwater and, and well water. Um, he has dealt with issues of large groundwater withdrawal wells before. Um, he has, uh, back when a year ago we had concerns about the water shortage that appeared to be the case, and, and I want to define that as being, it appeared that there was a lack of production capability for the demand that was presented on the system, not even considering the addition of stratum or any of its association. Um, and so we had Mr. Ballestero examine uh, at that time um, for us the, the, the what he could of the uh, particulars of the Aquarian system. 
and to give us questions to ask of Aquarian, which they have answered this year uh, to, to an extent about what their capability is. Um, I think it's very important to, uh, if we're going to be, and we should, get into evaluating what are the current capabilities of that system that we have his uh, expertise involved yeah. in this, and he is. It, okay, and specifically, is he uh, participating uh, in this uh, intervening uh, that we're discussing right now? Is I'm he coming up as a, an expert witness? Uh, I'm sure that uh, as part of articulating our concerns that he would be involved. Okay, and have we funded that? Do you have enough money to pay him to do that? No. Okay, let's talk about that right now, please. Okay. We've got cancer clusters. We've got uh, ever so. Let's talk about what your monetary needs are. And I had this discussion, uh, just uh, and not speaking for anybody with Mr. Ballastero. We pay him a rate, but with everything going on in this, this, this cluster issue, I think we need to expand that. And what would be bringing him on board uh, is, a, is a full time, part time uh, assistance to you, please. Sure. Uh, in, in terms of the issues that we've been talking about with Aquarian, the good thing about that is that both the towns of Hampton and Northampton uh, have agreed in, with regard to the projects he's just done. Uh, his extensive set of comments uh, that he provided uh, cost about $7,500 total. We pay 60% of that with an agreement that the board authorized us to enter into. Northampton pays 40% of that. Um, so if you're looking at that, at, for just for this set of comments on the large groundwater withdrawal, uh, he, uh, this cost to us would be approximately $4,200. But I think there's going to be follow-up needed on that. Um, my budget, uh, the legal department's budget for uh, litigation expenses for the year is approximately $5,000 at present. Uh, we've already uh, we already will have exceeded that with his his work on this and uh, other aspects and so uh, I would think that in order for at least his costs to to deal with the subject um, appropriately I should think we as, as a cushion uh, would want to raise that fund sum to approximately twenty thousand dollars because this large groundwater withdrawal is going to take up more time of his. We're going to be needing to address this, uh, the Eversource acquisition, um, and also uh, we are simultaneously dealing with an appeal from the DES order to, um, to um, make a permanent interconnection with the stratum um, uh, wells that have been plagued with arsenic and which they've been under <coughs> DES orders to remediate but have done nothing about. And so uh, on our backs, on the backs of the infrastructure that we are funding, 76% of, uh, we have every interest in making sure that, uh, that that, if that's done at all, that it be done in an appropriate way and not penalizing Hampton customers. Okay, thank and you. that so requires you Mr. Ballesteros' efforts as well. And for the record, he is a, uh, a doctor, a doctorate, and he is a professor at the University of New Hampshire. Yes, he is. He's an engineer, uh, licensed in several states, and uh, has been a professor at UNH for uh, many, many, many years. Okay, and then, uh, so a total of 20, is that in a, uh, on, on top of the five, or is it 15 more? 15 more. 15 more, and how do, how do we uh, go about doing that, Mr. Welch? Simply by an order of this board. Uh, I would make a motion that we authorize the expenditure up to $15,000 additional dollars for our expert, Dr. Bellastaro, to assist in the intervention on the uh, purchase by Eversource to uh, um, uh, assist with uh, the town attorney with the Department of Environmental Services on both our well safety, water quality safety, and our uh, interest as they relate to the cancer cluster uh, uh, commission. As part of the large groundwater withdrawal. Yes, sir. Thank you. Second. Okay. Um, discussion. Regina. Th this is what we need outside experts on, and I agree 100%. Rusty, we're going to go we'll find this in the budget. We'll find it. It, it. it deals with the public health of everyone in this town. Yeah. We'll find it. Rick. 
you know, I hope that this is the right way to do it. Um, I just don't know how effective it's going to be that we're going to if we're going to achieve anything here from what I've seen in the past. That's the problem here. Well, I would say just as one measure of it, uh, when Dr. Ballestero talks, DES listens, and you'll see that their their response to his comments of August 3 uh, are reflective of how much they respect him right. and, uh, have, as a matter of fact, have stopped the idea of the pumping test for the moment. Mm -hmm. and so what about the public utilities? Well, the Public Utilities Commission uh, so far has this joint petition that's rather thick with a bunch of confidential documents. And I'm not sure every source knows what they're getting into, but I think they will after we get involved. So what, the first thing you were asking for is just permission to be involved? To yes, to file a petition to intervene. Okay. So we so we got two issues here. Yes. About. How about if we deal with the first issue for, well, we got a motion and we got a second on the floor. Um, you would engage him only when necessary. I mean, this is not necessarily saying 15,000 and right away you go out and get him involved. Well, he already is. He already is, but, you, but, but he's, you, you're paying for what he's already done. Correct. So are you saying that you're going to authorize him up to 15,000 more? right away, or are you saying you're going to wait and see if you need him? He, he bills, it, w it would not be, we, I do not have, uh, our contract with him is, is uh, a joint contract with Northampton on an hourly basis. Uh, this sum of money that's being talked about here is to, is to provide the ability within the budget to cover whatever is expended for that reason. It's not to say we'll definitely expend it. That's it's, what I'm saying. That's it's as needed. That's what I'm asking. Uh, and you say that the we bill the line in, in Mark's budget that, uh, that refers to this particular matter, and that falls to the bottom line of the town budget. We always have money left over at the bottom line of the town budget. That's how it's always been handled in the past if you overexpend a particular line. Because you get monthly statements, uh, as you hear from the finance director, right. Uh, by statute, the fact that you get those statements allows you to uh, make an expenditure that exceeds a particular line, and automatically there will be, uh, if, it's, if it's not an expenditure in another, in any number of lines across the entire budget, that will be covered. If you, you don't need to identify a place to get it yep, from. Yep. Is Northampton going to go along with us, or do we need to involve them? Because now we're increasing. They went along with the first. We split it. What was the split? 60-40. Was that a con that they would continue to split 60-40, or is this something we have to go back to Northampton? Uh, I would go back to Northampton to the extent of involving Dr. Ballestero in this uh, acquisition by Eversource, which uh, he hasn't specifically been involved in, but a number of the issues that I've identified to you in the petition to intervene or touch upon the areas that he's already been involved in. And I'm sure that Northampton is, is going to wait uh, to find out, have been asking us, how are we going to approach the petition right. to intervene? And I'm sure that they will, will uh, follow along. And when you do the petition to intervene, then what's the procedure? So you send the thing that you petitioned to intervene. What happens? Uh, that is going to be uh, ruled upon by the commission on uh, August 17th. So they could say no? They could say no. Uh, they never have. All right. They may not have always listened to our concerns, but they've never uh, denied us the uh, ability to articulate them. Okay. Um, I do think that it's a great idea. That document needs to also go to Eversource. It will. They're, 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 this document goes to everyone who's okay. on the service list. Uh, but even if they aren't on the service list, it'll certainly go to Northampton and Rye. Okay. So we're voting on expending, I increasing the money. 
increasing a line item in the budget. Here was the motion, Mr. Chairman. The motion was to authorize uh, an expenditure of up to $15,000 to retain the service this year for Dr. Ballestero in the efforts of this intervention with the Eversource acquisition of uh, Aquarion. Uh, it's about water quality and uh, our, our testing and, and, and water quality in Hampton and assistance with the uh, cancer cluster as it relates to Hampton's interest. Okay. So we're going to take a vote on that. So there's the motion. We had a second. All in favor? Okay. It's unanimous. Now we put the cart before the horse here because we haven't voted to say you can intervene. So let's have a motion it, 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 well, on that. Well, yeah, and, and I just had more questions as we were going yeah, down. Why don't we take a vote oh, on oh, okay, I'm sorry, a motion to intervene first? Make a motion that Mark files a motion, motion yeah. to intervene. Second. Okay, all in favor of allowing the intervention? Yes, unanimous. Great. That is the cart before the horse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, re regarding your uh, alpha through motel and your, your uh, response that you've drafted, Purification and quality control. Uh, Carl McMorrin was in uh, and, and gave us the brief and showed us the uh, facilities that Aquarian has. It looks like someone was brewing uh, moonshine in a garage. Um, can you make that? Uh, uh, if it wasn't so dangerous, especially with these issues, it, it would be funny. Um, but it really did look that bad. Um, can we drill down on, on, in, with Dr. Bellsellis, especially uh, in this intervention, on uh, our purification and our, our quality control uh, infrastructure that is associated with uh, uh, that, that purchase? Because I think that those standards, uh, like a lot of other stuff we're seeing here, is abhorrently low. Right. Yeah. There, there's a proposal to uh, on the part that's been of Aquarian that's been said to this board and perhaps to Northampton that they centralize their water treatment infrastructure, not just at, not in the closet from well by well, but in a, one particular place. And that has a price tag. Uh, again, something Eversource needs to know if that's going to be implemented, that, that that will be done. Again, it will be added to the rate base that all of us pay for. Um, but nevertheless, it's critical to uh, maintaining water quality. Thank you. Um, uh, just a couple more things, Mr. Chairman, real important thing. We saw that um, in the current current state that uh, in Northampton, which is a much smaller consumer by virtue of the number of hydrants and, and, and customers, uh, this year there's a $130,000 and change charge just this year for services that weren't rendered. What are you doing to make sure, and let's, let's be realistic, the last three years that uh, Aquarium provides the data um, for what we've been charged for to make sure that we have actually had those services because in the last year, in, at least in Northampton, uh, and I would imagine it's company-wide, uh, yeah. that the services were not performed. What are you doing, Esquire and Mr. Welch, to uh, um, go back and, and, and do a clawback, if possible, in securing data to prove that services that we paid for were rendered? Well, this, this is a matter that uh, the hydrants comes up frequently uh, on the radar, but in terms of actual monitoring of how well they do it, uh, it's obvious that uh, this is Northampton's first time where they've said, let's escrow the money. This will be our first time that says we'll escrow the money. Um, it's, we've, we've, we've had to uh, engage with Aquarian on many different <laughs> aspects before. It takes up a lot of time. And now this is another one that's going to require a lot of attention. But, the, but, but I think what Phil was saying, and if I can just add, can we go and claw back? Say, if you haven't done it for the last three years, we paid for that, a service that was not performed. We have already requested the reports for the last three years okay. and twice and have yet, yet to receive them. Okay, so are we going to take some action, though, where we say, okay, we well, didn't get those escrow, services. Escrow the rest of the money until they provide the... I mean, I, I would think, I agree 100% that if they've not provided the services no. and we've paid for them, yeah, this could be hundreds of thousands of dollars, and, and, and I would, I would uh, um, uh, put this on for the next meeting, perhaps, Mr. Chairman, that you come up with a scheme of maneuver um, and consult with Northampton, and if necessary, um, 
get this before a judge to uh, get the records. It's hundreds and hundreds of thousands yeah, of dollars. Yeah, it's hundreds of thousands for Northampton. So it well, it's be. 130 for Northampton, and right, we're, we're so much larger. So yeah. next, next step for us is to go to the Public Utilities Commission and, re and request the reports that require it is required by law to file with them for this information. Got it. Got it. And Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, I'm just gonna, one last thing, and it's, it's just because it's so important. And Mr. Welch, you had a, a skimming maneuver. We've got a threat. We've got cancer clusters. Uh, we've got uh, a huge problem that, uh, um, if we're not careful, could imperil our water supply. Uh, what in the intervention uh, with Eversources acquisition are we doing? Uh, Mr. Welch, you discussed this. It's kind of your baby. Uh, uh, for groundwater uh, testing and for bedrock testing from Coakley to here in terms of phasing or uh, a spheres or diameters, please, sir. They have they have test wells at Coakley. There's a test well in the center of Coakley, I understand, which has the highest concentration of PFCs in the world. That's a bad sign. Uh, they have test wells around the perimeter of the landfill, which have very high readings of PFCs. Other than that, there are no test wells. There should be test wells out surrounding the landfill a half a mile out, a mile out, and a mile and a half out. There's a plume that's moving the plume of contamination and we don't know where it's moving to because there are no test wells out there is my understanding. Now I did ask Aquarian if there are any PFCs in their water supply and they indicated that there are some background PFCs under the federal limit. Well PFCs are man-made and they come from someplace. Right now the only source of PFCs is a Copley landfill. That to me means there is a potential for the PFCs to be moving in the direction of the water supply for this town. That's a bad thing for me to think about because I don't want that to happen. I don't want anybody here to be poisoned in the long run. If you're going to take a deep bedrock well, and we already know from the testimony that's been received that the PFCs are in the bedrock. They've migrated that deeply into the ground. If we're gonna start pumping over an extended period of time to test the well at a million three hundred and fifty thousand gallons, how wide is the cone of influence? That depends upon how wide the strata is where the water comes from and at what rate it's moving through. Could we pull more of that material into Hampton's water supply and therefore contaminate the wells and have no reliable water supply? This we don't want Flint, Michigan to happen here. So we need to have some means to require appropriate tests of, around the Coakley landfill, particularly in our direction, to show if a plume of influence is moving in this direction. My understanding is Aquarian has no intention of doing that, and the Coakley landfill people have no intention of doing that either. I, I and, and I, just to wrap up, Mr. Shikazu, I spent three hours in that meeting up there um, with with uh, Cushing, with Edgar, with Messner, and with uh, McConnell from Keene, and they've got an MBTE problem up there, and people's houses are worthless, and uh, they have a serious, serious issue, and that, that's the kind of stuff we're trying to head off, is that we uh, uh, employ uh, Dr. Ballestero, uh, for what he thinks is the appropriate um, uh, scheme, as you have just outlined, and, and mandate that in our intervention. Interestingly enough, yes, sir. there is a concern that this well is, with the, was, was, is within the groundwater influence of our former landfill. That's not a good thing either. I as well it. as in, within the scope of influence is several hundred feet below the level of the salt water line. That's also a dangerous situation because once you pollute the the underground aquifer with salt water, you're not going to get good water out of that aquifer and, and without some sort of treatment. Yes, sir. And fi finally, uh, the uh, DES and the EPA, uh, they did not have the sense of urgency as though they were going to be uh, having their children drink the water. And they, they were going to get to the testing, and there was no definite date. And they were, they were compel compelled to the reality. Uh, in support of uh, Representative Messner that uh, they didn't have the appropriate sense of urgency. Uh, and uh, they pushed back on that a little bit. Mr. Uh, Representative McConnell was very aggressive, and Representative Messner is very professional, very dedicated, and uh, you, your, your delegation uh, performed admirably. So uh, it, we concur that we will incorporate Dr. Bellistaro and make that part of our intervention requisites. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Escort. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now you've got both votes you needed, right? Yes. We Thank gave you the permission to intervene and to use Dr. Bellicero. Yes. Okay, so you're all set. Yes. Thank you. I think, however, the board uh, 
resets its non-public session that started at 6 o'clock, and uh, should the board wish to rejoin that session, you would need a, 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 a further vote to uh, go into a non-public session. I want to say one more thing in public, under old cool. business, new business, not sure. Cool. I want, I know this board's priority is to redo our ordinance, to revisit it. And I think before we figure out how we're going to do it. Was that noise you're talking about? The noise ordinance, okay. the entertainment ordinance, sorry. I know we before we decide how we're going to do it, what processes we're going to use, I really think it's important that the history of it is explained to this board and to the public. And I would like to have Brian Provencial, Vice Chairman of the Zoning Board, in for our next board meeting. So, I would like to make that motion to have him in as an appointment. And, and, and one more time, please, the motion. For Brian Provencial, who was the originator of the original ordinance in 2010, the past town meeting to come in and explain the history of it and what he did because we obviously need to do something similar with different results to make everyone happy. Okay. And is that consistent with what we talked about earlier? I have a problem with this. Uh, if we're going to do that, then we need to have the police chief come with him because the police chief is the one that worked on it. We might as well just have Al come in too because Al worked on it mm -hmm. with Brian. We don't have a so, second. So, you know, we don't have a second I have a big yet. problem here. Okay, we don't have a second. I don't have a problem with Brian and having him comment once we start working. <laughs> But he shouldn't be driving this bus. Right, right but we don't. We don't. We need to know the we, history we, of it before we, we start. Well, we have okay, hang on a minute. Please, Chief. Both of you, that. please. We've had a motion. We we're waiting for a second before we discuss it. I think it's a good idea to find, get the history. I think. Uh, you <coughs> got a second. It's in. Well, I'll second of a discussion. Then. Okay. Let's put it up for that. Then we go for discussion. I, and I and I agree with Rick that maybe we have while well, we have him here, uh, the police chief was another person that was on that committee. So I think the two of them come in here. And, and I believe Al us. worked on it too. Well, I know the police chief, and I know I know so, that the uh, the police chief is is one of our officials. Right. The, the only thing the only thing I, I would like to just add that we discussed this prior, mm -hmm. and the recess I thought was not to come back up tonight, but to come up at another time. Well, it's resurfaced like we knew it would, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. <laughs> this <laughs> needs to happen only, after the seafood festival, as far as I'm concerned. And that's. That's fine. Th then, so we can't do anything for the rest of the year. Then it will be the fall, no. and all the seasonal people that have concerns will be gone again. No, it doesn't work like that, Regina. Well, it doesn't work. This that's needs to be talked about. We can't talk about. So we have something that's broken. It needs to be fixed. We need to talk about this after the seafood festival. We just can't rush into things because it's easy for one person. Easy or for, for one person. Of. I'm trying to make everyone have a chance to speak before they leave again. Is they don't have, they can speak, people can have their, uh, what they want to say. We have to come up with a plan before people can start commenting people on it. People should know where if the law is no derived plan, from. Well, if we're going to have uh, people, then we, if we're going to have to ask for the input of people, then we need to have public hearings and all of that. I don't see that I'm happening the before the person who originated festival. the ordinance. Okay, he was chairman the of the police zoning chief. board at okay. the time. The police okay, chief. Fine, the chief whoa, whoa, here whoa, whoa. Regina, I think you are really, okay, uh, Rick, have some you, bias here. Rick, and it's really? showing really a lot. Rick, could you hang on? We're not going to. Yeah, this is yeah, really we're upsetting getting personality to me. here. Yeah. Please. And there's a problem vote. with I'm personalities gonna, here. I'm going to call for a vote. Well, there was there was kind of an amendment. There should be some discussion. And I, and I would say this, because we, we have discussed this. There is a, a tort <clears throat> issue. There is there is a court proceeding coming up. Is that correct? Uh, Regarding well, the noise ordinance in, that, in, a, in an establishment? I, I think the... Uh, the public should know that following the board's last vote, at um, where where the board changed the entertainment hours for um, for the rest of the year, uh, uh, granted, essentially there had been two temporary licenses yes. for Bernie's. Then the board at, at the meeting on the 24th uh, was faced with the decision of what do, what do we do on a permanent basis. Right. And the board decided for the rest of this cycle that the entertainment license of Urbernies would be that the uh, there was an hour <coughs> cut back from Monday to Thursday right. 
uh, so that the uh, ending hour for entertainment would be 11 o'clock. Right, and then Bernie, then they went to court. Then there was a court action filed by um, Bernie's where it sought to, um, to have the court on an ex parte basis uh, restore that hour for right. those four days. Uh, there was a court hearing on um, uh, Monday last, um, and the, the judge thereafter issued a decision upholding the board's this decision. board's decision. Right. Um, what will occur now is that uh, I have spoken with, uh, with the Bernie's counsel in between, and this board um, has authorized me to enter into a stipulation whereby the the action is going to be dropped in court so that we will not be facing a suit of any sort at present. So uh, the end result of that is the board is still left with deciding how does it wish to go forward with the uh, what we've all, I believe, identified as being there are shortcomings in what we have in by way of the ordinance now and how do we address them for the next town meeting. And, and I would say this, Mr. Chairman, and I would say this to, to, to fellow board members, is that uh, it was um, uh, not a life-threatening issue, but an important issue to both a business owner, uh, uh, to, uh, um, to families, and to, to taxpayers and citizens. And uh, the board did a great job. The judge said the board did a great job. And, and nobody is pleased when you go to court. There's always some people that win, if you will. There's some people that lose. And we've all been there. I uh, have have had to abstain from this issue and I feel that uh, if on a vote tonight I've got to do the same because we still have legislation uh, in session not legislation but a, but a court issue and I think it muddies the waters but I am interested in going forward I was the one person on the board that voted against the noise ordinance it was a five to one vote and my comments were when when I uh, voted against it was that it would end up in court again this is being made about I know, Al but, Flurry I know, this but, is about but, an ordinance but, but, that but can I just have the right so now. Can obvious can Regina has a bias wait, 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 here wait. but I I have a big no, problem. Break, I, know, can, can I have, I have not had it in the 15 right. years I've been okay, here. Okay, okay. Right. No, can I just have the floor, please? So I, I, I'm, I'm interested in it because I was the one guy. Were you here? I don't think you yeah, were here. Well, I was the one year I was off, but I lived this for about five years before. We took a vacation and he was there. And then, this is but, nothing new, what's happening. I'm, I'm the one person that voted for it. And I would say we just let um, this, you, you made the motion um, on this and, and the board accepted and voted and you won in court. It was your, your motion. Now going forward, we let the dust settle. We let everyone clear the legal shocks. And then we have discussed this earlier, and we bring people in, and we already discussed it. And, and I think people agreed with you. And uh, I don't think if we do it in the next two weeks, it's going to uh, make people happy. And I think it will be make people happier later on. That's all I can say. Okay, I think you. we need to set a date, though. Okay, and but wait, so wait, that wait, we, we have time. We have a motion right now, and we have a second. So we're going to vote on the motion and the second. All right, we're going to vote on the motion. So the motion, again, was to bring it up at the next meeting, right? Right, or some meeting. It doesn't, if it, you don't want it to be the next one, fine. But this shouldn't have anything to do with the litigation. Okay. This is the Board of Select. We know you're not happy with wait. the litigation. That wait. didn't go your Hold way, on. Regina. Hold on. Oh. So what I'm going to ask for is no, everybody in favor. She's not happy now. Everybody in favor of oh Regina's motion. Everybody in favor of Regina's motion? So no one's going to ever agree to have the chip. No, the I'm just asking for vote. No, Everybody in favor of the motion. There's yes. no second. Let's move the issue. It was a second. It was Rusty a second. seconded it. Uh -huh. I seconded it. I, I seconded moved it. the issue, I, 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 the vote. I'm asking for the vote. Any, all in favor. For Brian Provincial to come here at next Okay, all in second. favor. Yep. All opposed. My so thing with this, my abstention, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, an abstention for Mr. Bean, Mr. Chairman. I don't disagree with what Regina has said. Brian Paventure is an elected official in this town. He was on the zoning board when the zoning board worked on that. The police chief also worked on that, who's also an employee of this town. At some point in time. So did Al. Al is not an employee of this town. Well, he he's worked not on an elected it. I remember, official. I was there. He's not an elected official. He's not an, uh, an appointed official. At some point in time, we do need to, to address this. We agree with that at some right. point in time. And, right and, and one point of order is when we want people on, um, uh, on the agenda, you simply have to get with the town manager and get with the chairman. You don't even have to ask the board. And it was denied. 
Okay, well, going forward, after this all clears, I think it'll, it, you'll be successful. Go ahead, Rick. I would like to say that I would like to take this up after the Seafood Festival. I think we have information to be learned about noise that will happen. Uh, let Al demonstrate that he can do a great job, and I'm sure that he can. And he's been doing it. I haven't heard anything, too many complaints now. And let's hear about the noise from the Seafood Festival. We have a lot to learn. Let's take this up immediately after the Seafood Festival. That's when it needs to be done. So moved. You're moving that? You're so saying. I would like a motion to say that we take this up as an official matter after the Seafood Festival. Which is in second. three weeks. No second. I oh, second. second. Yeah, we're taking it up because you know we're taking it up anyway. And, yeah. and, and when it's three it's weeks, it's not two three weeks. Three weeks. weeks. Three weeks. And you get what you want. So the motion is second. Okay. All in favor? Okay. Abstaining? And that was on the noise ordinance, by the way. Yeah. Don't go away Closing with signature forms. Okay. Closing comments. <laughs> Again, if the board wishes to rejoin its non public session that was recessed between six and seven, it you have the ability to do so. That's do we need require to do a motion. We need it. Do we need it? Are we going in on something? Only if you wish to. It was another subject. Let's get out of here. Oh. What was it? Wait. Uh, it was a, a matter, I believe, of uh, of uh, salaries. No, we took care of that okay. in a public session. We had a vote. Yeah, we already voted. No, it was something. It had to do with the salary studies. Uh, oh. Uh oh. Oh, no, we're not doing that. Uh, not okay, tonight. that's fine. Thank okay, you. so closing comments. Uh, motion to adjourn at uh, 21.43. Second. Sure. All in favor. Very good. Nice job.